Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call uh, the Town of Grimsby Committee of the Whole meeting for Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022 to order. Uh, first off, are there any disclosures of interest? Seeing none, we'll um, move to approval of the agenda. Need a mover and seconder. Moved by Councillor Frank, seconder, Councillor Dunstall. Moved by Councillor Frank, second by Councillor Dunstall. Resolved that the February 22nd, 2022 Committee of the Whole agenda be approved. All in favor? That's carried. Now we're moving to um, adoption of previous minutes. Uh, library board, museum board, and art gallery board. Mover and seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Sharp, seconder, Councillor Bothwell. Moved by Councillor Sharp, second by Councillor Bothwell. Resolved that the Grimsby Public Library Board minutes of January 12th, 2022, the Grimsby Museum Board minutes of February 2nd, 2022, and Grimsby Art Gallery Board minutes of February 10th, 2022 be received. All in favor? That's carried. Now we move to item six, delegations. First up, uh, Derek Richmond, Canadian Union of Postal Workers. All right, it looks like Derek's not there. So we'll move to uh, Lori Laird, uh, Scout Guide Week uh, 2022. Lori, welcome. Yeah, I'll, I'll. Hello, Paul, I see you and, and we're just waiting for Lori to, uh, are you there, Lori? We just uh, had a power outage here in uh, our neck of the woods. So maybe okay. they <laughs> Yeah, it seems like you're not the only one on the east end yeah. of town. Oh, there she is. Okay. Hello, Lori. Uh, you are muted right now, so but um, we're ready for your presentation um, uh, on Scout Week. Welcome. Thank you. Am I sharing the presentation or is that being shared by our clerk? Yeah, you can you can share it if, okay. if you have the capabilities. I will. Give me one moment, if I may. Sure. Sorry, I I really am running late. So thank you. While I'm getting that set up, I'll say thank you very much for having us um, today. It is um, Scout Guide Week, so we're excited to just share a little information about what First North Grimsby is doing, um, and and uh, share share um, our programming and ideas of what we do. Um, Scout Guide Week is usually how this third week of February in honor of Lord Baden Powell, who is the founder of Scouts, and his birthday being on February 22nd. So I think I'm ready to share my presentation. If I can share my screen. So let me. Okay. Okay. We can see the show. Yeah, it's, it's, it's working. Perfect. Perfect. So again, thank you so much for having us. Um, First North Grimsby Scouting has been in operation since 1956. Um, so long history in Grimsby of, of having scouting um, uh, activities and organization within our town. Um, so we're really pleased to be able to share a little bit about what we do. Um, so a little bit overall, we are part of Scouts Canada, which is the country's leading co-ed youth organization. So um, some of you will know it formerly was Boy Scouts, but we are a co-ed organization now. So um, 
that's great. We have a lot of girls that participate as well. Scouts Canada does provide programming for children between the ages of five to 26, part of the world organization of the Scouts movement. So there is scouting groups across the world um, in, in about, I think, um, almost 200 different um, country organizations. So as I mentioned, February 20 to 20th to 27th is Scout Week. Um, so we are recognizing the, our founder, Lord Robert Baden-Powell. Um, you can see our Scout Canada mission there and our vision, obviously, to help develop well-rounded youth that are prepared for success in the world and youth that make a meaningful contribution to creating a better world. So a lot of the programming that we um, we provide are obviously to, to show our young people, our youth in the community of how they can give back to our organization and to our community as well. So a little bit overall about Scouts Canada. Um, First North, as I said, has been operating since 1956. We currently have a, hout, a scout hut located up on Ridge Road, just near Beamer Falls. So we're very lucky that we have a location right on the Bruce Trail. Um, outdoor activity is certainly a prominent part of scouting. And so we're fortunate that we have the opportunity to be right near um, the Bruce Trail and opportunities for lots of outdoor adventures. We're very also fortunate to be sponsored um, by the Branch 127 of the Royal Canadian Legion. So we'll give a little shout out to them because certainly they provide us support and assistance with our programming. Um, they've been our sponsor for about, since about 1959, I understand. So quite a considerable amount of time, which is great. Um, we currently have uh, about 56, oh, I might have the wrong presentation, 54 youth between the ages of five and 16. So we have one beaver colony. Um, beavers are between the ages of five and seven. We have two cub packs. Those are our kids eight to 10 years of age. And we have one scout troop um, between the ages 11 and 14. And we have a venture company this year, which is exciting. Um, and they're used um, between the ages of five, 15 to 18. We do have um, programming four nights a week. So that's um, a lot of use with our scout hut. And, um, we're, and then we do a lot of weekend activities as well um, going forward. We currently have about 13 volunteer scouters. We are lucky to have a couple with us today um, uh, to, to share in the presentation as well. So we wanted to just share some photos and um, some of the activities that the group does do. So we will just make note that some of these photos are from pre-COVID time. So you know, we are obviously um, following pro COVID protocols with masking and, and, and social distancing as well. So outdoor activities are very prominent within scouting. So here's a couple of photos of some of the things we do outside. So um, a lot of our older kids have been able to go out canoeing and learning about water and paddling, water safety, that sort of thing. As I mentioned, we are very close to the Bruce Trail. So you can see a familiar photo of the lookout up at the um, up at, up at Beaver Falls there. Um, campfires and our very prominent activity. And then you see that we've got some good activities out in the snow. So we've done some snowshoeing. Um, I've been told that all of the or all of the age groups, one of their favorite activities is making fires. So they enjoy that uh, that activity um, very much as well. So activity, outdoor activity has certainly been very prominent throughout COVID. Um, we certainly, um, with some restrictions, have been unable to be doing our indoor activities. So outdoor activities have, have featured heavily with that. So segue to indoor activities. You can see a few of the things we've had done including sleepovers there in the bottom right and one of our favorite activities is um, a beaver buggies cub cars and scout trucks so each of the kids are able to make one of these vehicles and then they race them we race them within our own um, group and then we've actually been able to do races within um, the little bit we, we race with Beamsville and Winona and then a Niagara region one as well so it's a good opportunity for the kids to engage in some friendly competition with our neighboring scout groups. Um, and I know it's very interesting. My husband is a scouter. My son is a venture. And my husband has his cub car from when he was a cub and has raced against um, my sons as well. So it's a, it's a neat kind of family activity as well. <clears throat> Camping obviously features prominently with our scouting activities. So here's a couple photos of us out and about scouting um, and camping. Um, we do frequently visit Camp Wetaskiwin in St. Catharines. Um, we've been to Camp in Pisa, which is just in, oh, I forget, just a little bit, uh, I don't know, Paul maybe can help me out. I forget where it is, but not about an hour's drive from here. And we it's also a, have been to 
Halliburton Scout, Scout Reserve as well, our older campers um, have spent a week um, camping out in Halliburton. So they do a lot of scouting activities um, from map reading, uh, hiking, even setting up camps and tents and their and fire pits and things is really great as well. And then, as I mentioned, um, we have had to adapt to the pandemic, as have everyone else. Um, so scouting did not stop while we were, we were in some lockdown and, and times when we couldn't be participating in person. So we did switch, as I say, as we have here, adapting to the new normal and going to a virtual component. Um, so we had, um, just like you have with your meetings here, we had online meetings through Zoom um, and different ways that we had to connect and, and work uh, in ways that we could still deliver the program despite being um, unable to get together in person. So you'll see on the right there, a tent inside. So while we couldn't camp together, there were ways that we could have camping together um, at home. So we have um, times when the kids had tents out in their backyard on their decks or even there in our living room. So we had to pivot just with everyone else with the pandemic and find ways that we could deliver the programming in a new way. Um, so we started with virtual when we were able, we were able to go outdoors and just recently we've been able to go a little bit indoors. Um, but it's been nice that scouting does focus so much on outdoors that we were able to continue with the programming in, in, a, in a new and modified way. Um, as I said, we have 13 volunteer scouters, so we're a happy lot. Uh, you can see some nice photos of how we are uh, enjoy the opportunity to deliver um, different programming to the to the kids, to the participants in our program. We have a couple of scouters who have been with us for a considerable length of time. Um, Russ Kelk, who may be on the call, has uh, been a scouter for over 70 years. Bill, who is at the top right corner there, he's been a scouter for 68 years. And Marg Lee, as well as one of our scouters, has been a scouter for 35 years. Some of us haven't been involved that long, but um, a true testament to what Scouts Canada offers to the community. And these long-serving volunteers are certainly a wealth of expertise and knowledge on outdoor activities and, and scouting as a whole. So we're, we're very grateful for um, the adults that um, put in time and, and give their, their time to, to bring, the, as we say, lead the youth along the Canadian path, which is the programming that Scouts Canada has put together. So we're fortunate. We have a good time, um, but we're able to deliver this opportunity to the youth in our community. Um, community services is definitely a very big part of, of scouting, and we want to give back to our town. Um, so some of the things that the, the boys and girls that in scouting have done is um, we are on, um, our hut is located on the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority land. So we have done some tree planting with them, um, which is great to, to give back to the, 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 the tree canopy up there. Um, we've had some of our younger participants write cards for um, people staying at McNally House or for our Canadian troops. As our sponsor is the Legion, we certainly support the Poppy Drive. Um, we've also done an arts and crafts drive um, to provide crafts for um, different children in need. And we've participated in food drives as well. So giving back to Crimson Benevolent Fund, which we know is certainly a very prominent organization with our town. Um, and so collecting from our children and from our participants and our parents um, to, to donate back to our community. So we do try to teach our youth how important it is to, to support those vulnerable people within our community and support and, and assist them where we can. We also like to be involved in the town as a whole. Lots of wonderful things that take place within our um, within the recreation department without different organizations. So a few things that we have done is uh, participated in the Rem Rem Remembrance Day ceremonies. Um, we have sponsored some skating at the Peach King Center, so that was nice to be able to give back to the community as so an opportunity for people to enjoy skating um, at no cost. We participated in the Santa Parade in the last number of years, um, including the reverse parade in, in 2020, um, where we had to move to something different, so that was fun. And then you've probably seen children out and about in the community during Apple Day, um, so that's where we have our beaver, beavers and our cubs and our scouts out and about town giving out apples um, to thank the community for the support of our organization. So we've had to pivot that activity to virtual as well, um, but um, we have had lots of lots of uh, success with um, uh, support or sharing sharing the apples with our town. We've had a, a great 
sponsor of Moyer Farms as well, who's been able to give us apples for, for that day um, to give out to the community. And of course, scouting, as I mentioned, is a worldwide global activity. So we've had the opportunity to visit the region and beyond. So just a couple examples of what we've done. Um, we have what's called Jada and Jadi, which is jamboree on the air or on the internet, um, where our children either um, go on the internet or on ham radios and are able to connect with scouts around the world. So it's a really neat opportunity for them to talk to other um, children from different parts of the world in the, in the same that are participating in similar activities that we are. We've had the opportunity to overnight at the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum as well, um, which was a, a really unique experience. And uh, the, the kids got to sleep underneath the airplane wings. And then during the pandemic um, last year, we were able to connect with scouts in Grimsby, UK, which was really neat to share that uh, uh, scouting camaraderie with our neighbor and our, and our namesake over across the pond. Uh, so a lot of opportunity for us to, to connect as I mentioned, we do our, our cub cars, beaver buggies, and scout trucks with um, with the with the Beamsville Scouts and with our Vineland Scouts and our neighboring sections. So it's it's nice to be able to connect with those that are um, uh, are, are experiencing the same opportunities that we are. So we're very fortunate that uh, we've had the opportunity to give these these kids. And again, we have about 54 right now. Um, continuing through the up and down cycle of the pandemic. So we're happy that we've been able to keep that number of, of participants and, um, um, you know, keep the scouting spirit alive within Grimsby. Um, again, as I said, First North has been around since 1956 um, and going strong, if I may say that as well. So happy to answer any questions if you have any, but I would like to say again, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come in and just share with you the the opportunities that we have um, provided the youth within the town of Grimsby. So, uh, well, thank you very there. much. And happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. All right, thank you very much for your presentation, Laurie and, and Paul. And uh, yes, it looks like we have some questions. Councillor Dunstall. Thank you, Your Worship, through you to, to Laurie. I just wanted to give a shout out to you folks. Um, uh, I go back uh, probably 40 years when my uh, most oldest son was uh, a beaver and I was a beaver leader for some time. And uh, you guys uh, do wonderful work. Uh, I just want to, all the volunteers, that, especially those who are dedicated most of their life to scouting, uh, the, the kids, the boys, the girls, uh, they don't know the value they're getting right now, but they will in time. And it's, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your, your service and your effort. Thank you. Councillor Frick. Uh, thank you, Mayor Jordan. Thank you, Laurie and Paul. That was a great presentation and it certainly gave us a, a very good perspective on, on how important it is to have youth programs like Boy Scouts of Canada or the Scouts of Canada has and how active you really are and how diverse your programs are in Grimsby is fantastic. So congratulations on your, is it, is it, the, is it the birthday of Lord Baden-Powell or? Yes, the birthday. Anniversary of his birthday. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So anyways, congratulations. I see you have a really full program and, I, and I, 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 I applaud you for being so proactive throughout the COVID and having, for example, digital camping. I'm not sure what that's gonna be like. It's not, I'm sure it's a lot different than sleeping under the trees and in the weather. So, uh, but, you know, uh, kudos to you for, you know, finding ways to bring scouting to uh, the kids through, through COVID. That's, that was, must have been very, had to be very innovative to do that. I have one question for you. You mentioned on one of your slides there that you have volunteer scouters. I'm just wondering what volunteer scouters are. Are they the leaders and the, uh, what are they? Yes, um, through you, Mayor Jordan, to the councillor. Yes, so scouters are the leaders. Um, so we, and all of us are volunteers. So in some capacities, we are working directly with the youth and leading the programs. And then in sometimes we're more administrative in the background, taking care of, of the, the, that side of things. Um, but volunteer scouters, scouters are the adults that are leading the programs. And they're okay. all volunteers. Thank you for that. And I, I must admit, I was I was a cub and a scout myself, but it's too far back for me to even remember anymore. 
but I'm sure it's a lot different today than it was when it was then. I, I don't think I would pass my not test at this point in time. So, <laughs> anyways, thank you very much and congratulations. Continue the good work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor. And thank you, Councillor Dunstall, as well. And, you know, we are always looking for volunteers, you know, if you want to crack out your neck here again. <laughs> Councillor Cadwell. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Laurie, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the group that's with you for the presentation. Uh, I was very fascinated by all the different events and the life learning experiences that you are, are providing for your, uh, for your, your scouts, and that. that's, that's amazing. It really was just to see what you people are doing in that, and, and, and great work. And, uh, and I know exactly where you're located, up, at the, uh, up on the hill there. That used to be the old Rhodes Department town barn. A lot, a lot of years ago, Lori, and it's uh, it's great that you you people have uh, moved in there and, and built your uh, your building here. Just just a, just curious with Scout Week, does it come with the a flag that we're able to fly at Town Hall? Is that part of the uh, part of the uh, uh, representing of uh, Scout Week, uh, Lori? Uh, yes, and and through the mayor to you, Councillor, uh, we do hope to raise the flag uh, with little with the holiday Monday yesterday and our presentation today. I've been working with the clerks department to hopefully get the, our flag up for the the remainder of the week. So, um, yes, our intentions are to to celebrate a little bit beyond today. That's great, Lori. Look forward to seeing that flag at uh, town hall. Thank you very much, and great work to everybody involved with uh, First North Grimsby Scouts. Thank you. Um, again, thank you, uh, Laurie and Paul, and, and it, it, to think it was uh, over 50 years ago when I was uh, a, cub, a cub in uh, Cor Coronation Park uh, by the Forty Creek. Uh, uh, so I do remember that well, so unlike Councillor Frake. But uh, um, now I'll move with the resolution. Uh, moved by Councillor Dunstall, second by Councillor Frake. Result of the delegation from the First North Grinsby Scouting Group be received and that Council proclaim the week of February 20th to 27th, 2022, Scout Guide Week, and that the request for a flag raising of the Scout Canada flag at Town Hall during Scout Guide Week be approved. All in favor? That's carried. And uh, thank you very much. And. Uh, the flag raising will be uh, Thursday morning at 11 at Town Hall. So we have we have a date and a time now, Lori. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mayor Jordan. And yeah. thank you, counselors. We appreciate your time. Happy Scout Week. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like uh, we may have Derek Richmond from the Canadian Union of Postal Workers. Derek, are, are you there? Derek, uh, if you unmute yourself, it should be good. We can see you. Yes. Thank you. Welcome, Derek. We're ready for your delegation. That's perfect. I apologize. I was trying to change my name over. Uh, apologize for the confusion. Um, okay. Well, thank you. Um, good day, Your Worship and members of council. My name is Derek Richmond. I'm the Ontario Region Coordinator for the Canadian Union of Postal Workers. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to Council on expanding service and protecting public post offices. Our Delivering Community Power campaign reimagines our post office to be the hub for rural communities, using our post office as a community hub that would provide much needed services that are lacking in rural Canada. The community hub model is currently being done in two Indigenous communities. These hubs have provided space for nonprofit organizations, an office depot kiosk with broadband internet, printer scanner, photocopying, so the community like youth, seniors can utilize resources. These hubs could also provide much needed financial services. Currently, there is a pilot project to provide small interest loans through Canada Post, and it must be extended to meet the needs of rural residents that don't have easy access to financial services. Other services Canada Post could provide at a community hub is hunting, fishing licenses, 
Space for Service Ontario, Tourist Information, Library Vending Machines, Space for Farmers Market and Local Art, Canada Post, 7,000 locations could be retrofit with solar panels and create a secure coast-to-coast -coast network of charging stations. This public charging network would lead to additional tourism in rural Ontario for those who own electric vehicles. Canada Post can also become a leader in providing services to seniors through an elder check-in program. COVID lockdowns have taught us that seniors are the most vulnerable to the lockdowns. And a letter carrier check-in program can assist seniors that are shut in and provide additional security for seniors to live independently. Canada Post can provide delivery of groceries and medication to seniors that have difficulty navigating through COVID. Canada Post must lead the way in a carbon-free post office. Currently, Canada Post has approximately 20,000 vehicles on the road daily and converting the fleet to Canadian manufactured electric vehicles needs to be a priority to meet the 2050 emission targets. Canada, Mo Canada Post must become a leader in a carbon-free delivery. To this date, close to a thousand municipalities supported resolutions that have been submitted to the federal government on service expansion and postal banking. There are many innovative and forward-thinking ideas for a post-COVID recovery to improve service at Canada Post for rural communities and protect good paying jobs. This will enhance our national infrastructure, social communities, and strengthen economic viability of rural communities across Canada. But we still need municipalities like Grimsby to continue to put pressure on the federal government to ensure rural municipalities receive the service they deserve from their public post office. On behalf of the Canadian Union of Postal Workers, we ask that the municipality of Grimsby endorse the delivering community power resolution, resolution to support, retain, and enhance, expand rural post offices. Thank you for your time and support. I'm willing to answer any questions or concerns council might have. Thank you very much for your presentation, Derek. Uh, any questions or comments from council? Seeing none, uh, we just need a mover and seconder. Moved by Councillor Ritchie, second by Councillor Frake. Moved by Councillor Ritchie, second by Councillor Frake. Resolved that the delegation from Derek Richmond be received. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much, Derek. You have a good evening. Thank you very much for your time. Bye. I know. Now we move to our consent agenda. All right, need a mover and seconder for the consent agenda. Moved by Councillor Dunsell, seconded by Councillor Barty. Just the first one there. Okay. Moved by Councillor Dunstall, second by Councillor Vardy. Resolve that the Committee of the Whole hereby approves the following items and that the various consent items be approved on the recommendation as contained therein. Report DRS 22-04 Mayfair Pickleball Courts Construction RFP 2021-04. All in favor? That's carried. All right, now it's a notice of motion. Introduction date, February 22nd, 2022. Uh, subject, return to in-person meetings. Requested by Councillor Vardy. Whereas if public health and healthcare indicators continue to improve, the following public health and workplace safety measures will come to, into effect on March 1st, 2022. Capacity limits will be lifted in all indoor public settings. Proof of vaccination requirements will be lifted with businesses being allowed to implement them voluntarily. Other protective measures such as ma mask, face covering requirements and active passive screenings of patrons will be continue to be in place. Whereas 
should public health units not deploy local and regional responses based on local health indicators, be it resolved that council return to chambers effective March 21st, 2022, and that the public be permitted to return to chambers for all council and committee of the whole meetings at that time. I acknowledge that this notice of motion will be given consideration at the March 7th, 2022 committee of the whole meeting. All right, now we're moving to 11.1, uh, planning and development allocations. Uh, welcome, uh, we have a large group here uh, from Castle Point Numa and SVN Architects and Planners, uh, Elsa Frankello, Harley Valentine, Jasmine Frolick, Drew Sinclair, Aaron Budd, Stephanie Hardes, Emma West, and Allison Tudor. Welcome. Not sure who's going to lead first. All right, I think uh, Aaron is leading off. So welcome, Aaron. Hi, good evening, all. Good evening, Mayor Jordan and councillors. Aaron, you'll um, share your screen and we'll we'll do the introductions. Yes, just bringing that up right now. <laughs> While we're waiting here, I uh, I wanted to thank the uh, the scouts myself. Fond memories of. Uh, participating, participating in that big rally. I, you know, I remember my father very quickly took over the crafting of my cub car. And, uh, you know, th that may speak towards where I am today as a builder, you know, that, that repression at an early age to, uh, to build something on my own. Um, it proves uh, probably good motivation for me today, but uh, God bless the scouts. Obviously as a Grimsby native, I, I know it well. And, uh, it's great to see them uh, pushing through with all these COVID restrictions. So, uh, so important for the youth. So that, that means a lot to us. Um, council and community, and I'd like to thank town staff for setting up tonight's meeting. Um, we are very excited to be here um, on behalf of Castle Point. Uh, I'm joined by um, our vice president of planning and development, Elsa Fanchello, um, Jasmine Frolick, our development manager, um, we have, of course, SDN Architects here who are design lead on the project. Uh, we're joined by with Aaron Budd and I believe Drew Sinclair as well as on the call. Uh, we also have Stephanie Hards from uh, BA Transportation Group. Um, and also uh, we have those fields here today, I believe, uh, Emma West and, uh, um, and, um, and her associate. And we're also joined by Marilyn McCray, who is our community engagement facilitator. So, Really pleased to have the team here and to be in front of you for this uh, committee of the whole uh, meeting. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So we'll start with the project vision statement. And um, we put this together at a very early stage and we put a focus on bringing residential retail and community spaces together into a vibrant mixed use site at the corner of Mountain and Elm. And I just wanna pause on this for a moment and talk a little bit about the journey that we've been on for the past four years. So we had the opportunity to strategically acquire these two sites together in 2018. And at the time, it was a bit of a rediscovery moment because I had grown up in the shadow of these heritage buildings and they were at a fall from grace. Uh, 13 Mountain was, uh, you know, it had a tarp on its roof. It had a tenant that was fleeing. 19 Elm Street was, uh, suffering as, and struggling as a commercial operation, as a billiards hall, and um, it, the buildings were not cemented in um, in their in sight as they were in my imagination as 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 growing up and as a child uh, and a youth of Grimsby, and sort of there lies the vision um, in restoring these buildings and really rediscovering the energy that they have to provide to our community. And you know, I think within that energy, um, both the design architects, uh, both our planning um, staff and consultants have really put forward 
a compelling, responsible growth approach to infill intensification. And I say infill to intensification because, again, when we bought these sites, we bought them with something very specific in mind, and that was a higher and better use because it was very clear that they required a new life. Um, downtown intensification, which provides for a higher density than downtown Main Street, and also a variety and expanded of uses. Um, so, you know, with that vision, we have gone forward over the past four years, and we've been in this community for about two and we've done exhaustive community engagement it's over some 500 conversations that led to two public open house meetings where we saw 22 um, delegations in support of a development application. I think that's very unique. On top of that, we had 27 letters and testimonials from merchants of Grimsby, from community members, from residents, and, and, and community leaders that really stepped up to talk about what's been the past 30 years of downtown Grimsby and how we need to build for the future and really take this moment as a catalyst to reimagine and really revitalize downtown Grimsby. So that's not lost on us. All while in the backdrop of living in a one of the most difficult times to find a home, whether you're a small family, whether you're a, when you're, whether you're a senior, that ladder as far as housing stock in Grimsby is very short. And um, what we are proposing is a purpose-built rental building that will expand the diversity of housing opportunities. That was very important to us because we heard that over and over again. Next slide. So again, how we found the site four years ago and where we stand today with this artist interpretation led by SDN Architects is really cementing these buildings for the next 100 years. What was really important and where we started was with just that, the heritage buildings. And we responded to these heritage buildings by pushing our build form all the way to the east property line um, and pulling them as far back from that mountain street edge as possible. And in doing so, we created something really special. And we've always talked about this, uh, whether at the DIA, um, or in, in other uh, special interest groups in downtown Bruce about creating that village square, that place where community can meet, where there's no cost of admission, and when it could be potentially programmed to benefit the wider community here in Grimsby. It's very important to us. And also within those buildings, using the power of community to really cultivate that heritage energy and speak towards um, uh, an adaptive reuse that is going to be a compelling case study for, you know, I think on a global scale. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really within those uses that will activate these buildings and will continue to drive the identity of the site. Next slide. Creating an improved and inviting entrance to both community hub and rental building on Elm Street. This is a very strong image. Uh, and I like this image a lot because Elm Street is rather forgotten. You know, down street, uh, downtown Main Street and any investment has not hit Elm Street to date. This is really the first time where an investment is going to strike Elm Street and create a new compelling um, dialogue of truly um, delivering on the promise of expanding uh, downtown Main Street. So um, th that's when I look at this image, that's what's speaking to me. Also the opportunity to give that community hub a strong front door. So whether you're driving by during the day, you can look through that transparent glass and see community activation or after hours, how it's lit up and how this community doesn't stop as far as engagement, as far as meeting, and as far as driving forward. Very important to us. Next slide. Maintaining the low rise character along Mountain Street while widening the activating the public realm. This was a very important image for us, but also for the Niagara Scarving Commission. You know, we work to sculpt this building, not only pulling it back as far as possible from Mountain Street, but sculpting, sculpting it at both the four and six story datum line to not impact or interfere with existing sight lines. We went through exhaustive studies with the Niagara Scarving Commission and actually came out with their approval. I feel very confident about that today. I feel very honored to have that um, and to have their endorsement moving forward on this project. Next slide. Creating a large town square at the heart of the site 
framed by the two restored heritage buildings. I love this image because this image really captures my vision for the future of downtown Grimsby. This is an abundance of community interaction. This is an abundance of open space in a backdrop by two landmark heritage buildings. This is uh, from a architectural, from a development point of view, this is such a unique opportunity. And this is one that we're not going to waste. Uh, we've given it very detailed attention and we will continue to do so through the site plan approval process. But this is what really excites me and I look forward to having more meaningful conversations, um, both with council uh, and with staff about how we're going to deliver in detail this component of our project. Next slide. Activating Wolverton Hall with community and non-residential program. This Wolverton Hall space has the potential to provide that indoor space that we do not have today. We're seeing it um, displayed through the activation of the GBS Wellness Hub. We're seeing it displayed through the monthly meetings of the DIA and other interest groups, special meetings that are happening in this place. This is a place where it, it's, it's a non-commercial uh, use space that can be programmed for community by and large to have public open house, to have meetings, to have special events, and to do so in a very dynamic landmark location. Here in this image, we've envisioned a bit of a food hall, which could have been, you know, building on the uh, former, um, uh, building on the former farmer's market, which used to exist downtown Grimsby. And, and what I see in this image is, uh, and what's really strong for me is, there's a passageway back out to Elm Street, and there's a passageway back into the community plaza space. The idea that you can pass through one and go into the other, and really creating that indoor-outdoor space dialogue, free from, um, free from uh, obstructions, but also visibly open, very, very important. Next slide. So at this point, Aaron, I think I'll pass it over to you um, to take us through some of the technical design drivers of the site and uh, provide any comments where um, where I may. Great, thank you, Harley. And uh, good evening again, Mayor Jordan, members of council, uh, town staff, and uh, the residents of and neighbors of Grimsby. Uh, tonight, I'll provide you with a bit of an overview of the 13 Mountain and 19 Elm Street proposal that reimagines these lands as part of a, a new mixed-use community in the heart of Grimsby. Uh, the starting point to ima or imagine this development or on the site was to really celebrate the existing buildings and, and to breathe new life into them. And it was set out by doing this by retaining as much of the original buildings as possible. Um, and both that's A here, the Wolverton House, and uh, the church building, or the now called the, the Wolverton Hall. Um, and in preserving these, exi these existing buildings in their location, it really opened up a, an opportunity for a, a new public space there that Harley was speaking to, uh, number two. Um, and what, uh, what this does, in, what it proposes, is a new mid-rise building that's set back uh, behind the heritage building that provides really a backdrop to the plaza and plays a secondary role uh, on these by animating each of these streets. Um, so the site plan, here we are as it exists today. Uh, there's it includes two important buildings that have been here for over a century, the original Wolverton House that we're looking at here, and then the, the Wolverton Hall, uh, both from around 1880. And they'll be maintained on site, uh, at least three of their facades in this proposal. The former carriage house, uh, which has been widely altered to accommodate uh, various functions, including the, the music school, um, will, will not be part of the proposal, but will be documented uh, through historic photos and uh, archives and, and located in the archives. Um, the Wolver <clears throat> excuse me. The Wolverton House and the Wolverton Hall both play an important role as part of this development, but more importantly, they tell the history of the site and in Grimsby. So the maintaining these was really kind of one of the key pieces in this proposal. Uh, just going to the, the uh, 
uh, to the official plan and the zoning bylaw designations here. The subject lands lie within the uh, the downtown district land use designation, and more specifically in the downtown intensification area. Uh, this designation shown on the right in the zoning map, uh, the zoning bylaw map uh, outlined in red here. The official plan sort of states that the intent of the downtown intensification designation is to provide opportunities for large scale commercial development, mixed use developments, and significant residential intensification. This, <clears throat> this is highlight uh, on the uh, this is highlighted on the left in the official plan uh, map here. I won't dive too deep into this, uh, but it's as the staff report points out uh, in the attached agenda that uh, it outlines how this project is compatible with the the, the vision of the of the official plan. Um, but generally, it speaks to the sensitivity of the architectural style scale and the building massing and landscape design principles that will need to be incorporated into this proposal. So responding to the context here, um, as I'm sure you all are very well aware and everyone knows, there's one of the greatest amenities to this project into downtown Grimsby is really, and it was also an inspiration design, is the Niagara Escarpment. Um, and the building and the, the site located at the foot of the escarpment is really one of the natural features uh, that was an inspiration for a lot of this project. Um, the natural features of limestone and some of the oldest forest ecosystems are really a backdrop to Grimsby that we want to celebrate through this project. Um, the site is located here in the pink, uh, very much at the heart of, uh, of Mountain Elm and Elm Streets, and is very central to an array of amenities as uh, highlighted with these various asterisks. Um, but itself is also an amenity to the communities that it sur that surrounds it. The 500 meter uh, radius here uh, shows about a five or six minute walking distance in which we find schools, library, uh, galleries, groceries, and other services. So it's really quite central to a lot of things and creates a very highly walkable uh, development. Uh, during our process, we spent considerable time really understanding and looking at uh, how this development sits within this block uh, today and in the future as the, the downtown develops. So understanding the character of these streets, the urban fabric uh, within this downtown triangle was really important for us. The main street, uh, which is a true historic main street uh, with its commercial floors or commercial kind of uh, ground floor focus, Mountain Street, we understand is a very as a major kind of north south connector, um, but also you know has these two very historical or important historical buildings on it, and then Elm Street as this buffer between what we call the downtown intensification, and then the more residential uh, neighborhoods to the south there. Uh, so now we're going to go through a bunch of the uh, series of design drivers. Um, that were presented at the last public meeting on December 16th. Um, but I'd like to revisit these because these are really the kind of guiding principles on how this project was developed and how we, we use them to create this vibrant mixed use community. So the first one that here is really celebrates the two, um, the two heritage buildings on the site and not just the facades. Uh, like we've said before, it's really these the three sides of them and then taking these, these, these heritage buildings and repurposing them or reprogramming them to complement the proposed residential uses. Uh, we're imagining that these will house food and beverage um, that open up onto the plaza, as well as the ground floor, uh, or sorry, as well as the, uh, the Wolverton uh, uh, Hall here on the right as being a really a community type space uh, in its programming. Uh, the other driver was setting in order to sort of maintain the prominence of these two historic buildings. Um, you know, the main mass of the building was to be set back as much as possible from the street. And we were able to do this about 22.5 meters or 70 feet from the Mountain Street right of way. Uh, this creates a greater sort of public realm along Mountain Street, which we all know has quite heavy traffic. Uh, so it provides some respite from this condition. 
and also creates a safer kind of public realm as people move through this area. Um, it's really important that we, in, in maintaining this, this kind of prominence of these buildings, it, uh, it creates a significant opportunity for open space between them, um, which really leads us to the, the next design driver here, which is creating this large uh, central plaza or town square uh, or village square as, uh, as Harley referred to it. And the building was really envisioned from the ground up, right? It's this idea of taking a first step at looking where we can create these public spaces and open spaces and then placing the building appropriately on the site. Um, this is really, you know, the, the, the most kind of exciting part of this and probably the likely the main area that many in this community will interact with this development. Uh, we also want to promote this diverse number of uses across the site. Um, so here we see the, uh, the kind of ground floor of the proposed development and the, the mix of residential, uh, the yellow uh, commercial retail in, in the pink there in the Wolverton house and the community um, cultural piece at the Wolverton Hall. Um, noting that the, the yellow resident, excuse me, re residential floor plates um, have entrances on both Mountain and Elm Street. So they really help to activate uh, both the frontages, but also have a amenity space proposed that would open towards the, the plaza for their animating that space. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. And just, just to pause on this image for a moment and looking down at 30,000 feet, you can see on uh, all four sides of this building um, generous setbacks and, and the, really representing a bit of an antithesis to the squash and spread approach. Um, that was very important to us. Um, to take this opportunity with this land that we have and open it up as much as possible to the community. So that is a community forecourt in front of the Wolverton Hall, the community plaza, um, then, and then a small community forecourt in front, in front of the Wolverton House. So really not dropping a beat on activating that edge as you head west along Elm and then heading north uh, along Mountain Street. So it's really going to be a compelling um, a compelling urban condition um, and, and a really one that will set a tone for reimagining downtown Grimsby and revitalizing downtown Grimsby. So that's great. Thanks, Aaron. Keep going. Yeah, no, that's a great point that it's um, it, the, just, the open just, space. Uh, Aaron, just, yeah. just to um, uh, interrupt, and again, I'm sorry, uh, because our procedural bylaw allows uh, delegates 10 minutes, then um, we've already done the five minute extension. So what um, we proposed is we have a um, uh, resolution to waive procedures. Uh, so we need a mover and seconder, and this is for all council, we need a mover and seconder to uh, waive procedures to uh, allow um, a further discussion on this. And uh, it does require a two thirds vote. So um, if uh, council wants, to uh, entertain listening to uh, more of this presentation, uh, we need a mover and seconder and we need to vote on this. I'll move it, Jeff. Councillor Vardy and Councillor Cadwell second. And we can have discussion on this as well. So uh, we can uh, populate a speaker's list if someone wants to discuss. Councillor Sharp. Can we set a time limit? How much longer do they need? Uh, Eric, uh, uh, do, what do we need? 10 minutes to wrap this up? Yeah, we can do it in 10 minutes. Yep. All right. So, so I still want to procedurally do this correctly. So uh, we do need to, um, to vote on this uh, um, waiving procedure. So uh, I have the resolution here now. So moved by Councillor Vardy, second by Councillor Cadwell. Resolve that procedures be waived for the delegation from Castle Point Numa and SVN architects and planners to allow further speaking time. Um, I'm gonna do a, I'll do a show of hands first. And if I can't determine that, that I will ask for a recorded vote. So all in favor? You know, let's just do a recorded vote. Mr. Bothwell? Yes. Mr. Denstall? Yes. Mr. Frake? 
Yes. Councillor Cadwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Yes. Councillor Vane? Is not here. Councillor Vardy? Councilor Vardy? Yes. Mayor Jordan? Yes. yes. That's carried. All right, so Aaron, uh, go ahead. Yeah, Thank no you. more Boy Scout stories that delayed us, so let's keep, keep trucking there. Okay, thank you all counselors. I very much appreciate that extra time here. Uh, so yeah, just going back to finishing off on this slide that we really uh, open, it opens up the, the site to a lot of publicly accessible space. And this brings up the next point that there is no parking uh, really at grade. The parking is, has all been kind of concealed within a two and a half level um, parking garage below grade and that also the loading is interior and concealed within the building. And this really takes a lot of that kind of unsightly and noisy uh, activity away from uh, visibility and uh, keeps it within the, the building um, form or mass. The, uh, the next piece here was to really uh, understanding this kind of urban fabric here and designing from the ground up was to ensure connectivity uh, was maintained to the uh, existing uh, parking lot there and the proposal upgrades this to a sidewalk condition along the north property line that connects Mountain Street to the public parking and then beyond uh, uh, through the buildings um, towards Main Street. Yeah thanks Aaron and, and just to go back to it for a moment this was very important for us you know at the Wolverton we want to play our strengths as a community and in delivering 73 apartments or some potentially 150 people to give them a very close A to B to becoming a, a, a shopper or a buyer or a driver of economic growth uh, and development in downtown Grimsby. We do not have a strong retail component because we, we're gonna play our strengths and we know that's housing. And we wanna make sure that our housing stock has a safe and very quick, efficient way to get down to Main Street and walk through those shop doors. Thanks, Aaron. So in creating this, this uh, the massing here, we needed to respond to a, a various conditions along the street edges. Uh, and in particularly, the, we introduced a series of setbacks and stepbacks that would respond to these. So on Elm Street, uh, we created the four-story street wall, which speaks to uh, the as of right condition, and then stepping that back uh, at a 45 degree angular plane um, towards the north here as well the major mass that we went uh, through before was set back 22.5 meters. But again, where we have to extend front entrances so that they can meet uh, fire accessibility requirements towards the street, we're also stepping back those masses um, against the street walls. And then similarly on the, the, the top floor, uh, a series of setbacks to reduce those kind of visual appearances from the streets and also uh, mitigate any shadow, shadow excuse me, impacts um, on adjacent public realms. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, just, just to speak further towards that, um, you know, we, we had exhaustive conversations with um, town staff and the region about these step backs, and it was um, very um, motivating to find a staff report that supported this sculpting approach and really the impact and, and uh, the, the impact that would be mitigated through this sculpting. So uh, I think it's very smart and it's, and it's very considerate. But thanks, Aaron, keep going. Uh, so Harley spoke a little bit about this at the beginning of bringing really rental housing and much needed uh, sort of people to the downtown core. And this also um, is uh, kind of what the, the downtown intensification policies of the official plan set out to do as well. Uh, with 73 units of rental housing, uh, it's not only bringing that many more people than that to, in close proximity to the main street, but also it's a highly connected development. Um, as you can see here with this direct access to, to main street through uh, along Elm, along Mountain Street and through this network of uh, lanes. Uh, also one of the key considerations here was uh, because the building does contain a number of programs, we wanted to sure, make sure that all of those programs are highly visible from the streets. So making sure that each of their entrances, their primary entrances were visible from Mountain and Elm Street. And here just highlighting in the, the yellow, the residential entrances, the two of them, one off Mountain and one off Elm. 
the uh, community or cultural kind of entrances in blue towards the um, Wolverton Hall. And then that commercial retail entrances again off of Mountain Street. Uh, the proposal seeks to to create a diversity also in these in these rental units. So not just uh, all one type, but a series or a, a variety of one, two, and three bedrooms, and trying to keep primarily in those two to, to three bedroom uh, areas uh, sizes, um, which also includes a number of grade related units. So it's directly accessible from the ground, which will further animate uh, all sides of of this building. Um, as part of the, the staff report and as part of the agreements uh, towards site plan, uh, the, uh, this proposal will be part of a uh, urban design review panel. And that's really to look at how the building facades are articulated through variations in materiality and colors, really break down the visual impact of, of height and, and length of the facade. So this, this slide sort of speaks to that approach. This isn't, these are just conceptual kind of elevations. Um, but it also speaks to the step backs that were referred to before and setbacks of the, uh, the building from the streets. A couple of the proposed uh, uh, renderings uh, starting with, uh, from the left with the, uh, the Mountain Street perspective, looking to the so, south. So, so Aaron, I, I'm, just, I'm just mindful of time. I think we covered these in the opening. Um, let's just uh, um, key, is okay. there another slide? <laughs> Yeah, just to go into the, the overall proposal here, uh, it's mixed use. So it's looking at some new, uh, the new residential GFA. It's looking at a, a non-residential floor area and then um, some of the existing floor area within the two buildings for a combined uh, gross floor area of 6,993 square meters or roughly 75,000 square feet, seven stories in height, um, with a measured height of 25.424 meters, uh, not including the mechanical penthouse, and then a, a mix of units that equate to about 73 um, individual dwelling units. Uh, also a ample bicycle parking is proposed on site and uh, the 102 uh, parking spaces below grade that will be for residents and uh, visitors to this development. And then just to finish off with two last uh, images, again, looking at that, that highly animated courtyard with it uh, between the two historic buildings that really is, uh, as Harley was kind of pointing to a, a village square that is uh, you know, very active in its programming, uh, opening up to the wall. Dire directly Hall. connected to that interior amenity space um, on, the, um, on the east, um, on, on looking, I guess that's on the, uh, the east side there, that's right. Yep, that's right. So connected to each component of this building uh, through the glass door here towards the Wolverton Hall, uh, the, uh, the main residential amenity space. And then what we're looking at is from the, uh, the Wolverton House or that potential kind of cafe or restaurant uh, within that. And then finally back to the, the interior view of the, the Market Hall or the Wolverton Hall here um, used for its community functions. I think we'll, we'll finish up on this slide here that really just uh, highlights the, uh, the uh, summary of the highlights of this proposal. Uh, it's really all about this adaptive reuse of the heritage buildings, uh, creating this public gathering or green space or village square. Uh, and then it's also through its you know, uh, intensification, meeting the, uh, the region and the town's downtown intensification objectives. Uh, for bringing people to the downtown, adding new housing with a high walkability score, providing a mix of residential, retail, and community uses. And then, uh, you know, as town and region staff have completed their technical review and confirmed that the, the Wolverton proposal conforms to the provincial policy and meets the region and town's policy objectives. Uh, it was also noted in the report that they're very supportive of the town's recommend, or we're supportive of the town's recommendation uh, to approve the proposed amendments to the official plan and zoning bylaw. So, Aaron, is this the last slide? We're going to end on this one right here. Oh, okay, yeah. perfect. So, so just in closing, you know, I spoke about our enthusiasm and our excitement for being here tonight, and it's it's through the support of um, a number of agencies um, that have.
pledged their commitment to the project, including town staff, Niagara regional staff, um, uh, the DIA, um, uh, the NEC, um, and also our community partner, the GBF. You know, we're not looking for um, special treatment on this project, but we truly believe it is a special project, um, a market rental housing building built in the heart of downtown Grimsby. So um, we're very excited um, and, and not a moment is lost as far as investment or care or attention to this project. And I know through, like I said, our over 500 conversations over two years, um, neither is it on this community um, or the council or the staff. So this is really where the rubber hits the road and we get to start making some very bold decisions, exciting decisions uh, about moving this project forward. So we look forward to, again, passing it over to um, town staff um, and council for any questions that they may have. Thank you, uh, Harley and Aaron, for your presentation. And uh, we just have uh, need a mover and seconder to receive the presentation. Moved by Councillor Frank, seconder, Councillor Bothwell. Moved by Councillor Frank, second by Councillor Bothwell, resolved that the delegation from Castle Point Newman, Numa and SVN architects and planners be received. All in favor? That's carried. All right, so our, our second delegation, um, um, Jamie Moore, or Noor, um, does not seem to be here, but uh, they did provide a written delegation, so we just need a mover and seconder to receive the, their written delegation. Mover and seconder. Moved by Councillor Vardy, second by Councillor Frank. Moved by Councillor Vardy, second by Councillor Frank. Resolved that the written delegation from Jamie Noor be received. All in favor? That's carried. All right, now we move to uh, report 11.2A, uh, report PA 22-06, uh, proposed, proposed official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment. Um, Walter, or is it Antonetta? Hello, it'll be me. All right, great. Just Welcome, Walter. To, hello, uh, just wait for Peter to start the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mayor, members of Council, and members of the public tuning in to the meeting tonight. Uh, my name is Walter Basic. I am the Assistant Director of Planning for the Town, and I will be presenting a brief overview of the staff recommendation regarding the proposed official plan amendment and zoning amendment for 13 Mountain Street and 19 Elm Street, which was detailed in Report PA 2206. That is on tonight's agenda. Next slide, please. Subject lands consist of two lots being 13 Mountain Street, which uh, as was mentioned previously, supports two existing buildings, the Wolverton House, and uh, which is a former dwelling, which is converted to mixed uses over time, and the Carriage House, uh, which is located in the northeast corner of that lot. And also 19 Elm Street, which supports one existing building, which is Wolverton Hall, formerly originally constructed as a church. The subject lands occupy a total area of approximately a third of a hectare, uh, which translates into approximately uh, three quarters of an acre. Next slide, please. This is an illustration uh, that you've probably seen earlier in the presentation, uh, uh, which is a conceptual site plan showing the site layout uh, with the inset uh, lower left corner illustrating the proposed massing in perspective. Uh, the applications are to specifically amend the official plan to permit seven stories on the site where six is permitted under certain circumstances, and, and to modify the existing zoning bylaw and zoning regulations on the site to permit the proposed development. 
Some say statistics are as follows. Uh, I may be repeating something you've already heard. Uh, lot coverage of 51.5%. Gross floor area, 6,993 square meters, 6,531 of which are residential, 187 square meters of commercial, <clears throat> retail, and 275 square meters of community hub space. Uh, the floor space index, which is a measure of the total gross floor area of of the buildings on the site relative to the lot area is 2.33, which means that uh, uh, the floor area of the gross floor area of the of the buildings on the site is approximately 2.33 times the lot area. Uh, there are 74 residential uh, units proposed, 26 are one bedroom as noted previously, 41 two bedroom and seven three bedroom. Uh, there are 100 on-site in-building parking spaces proposed. Again, 84 bicycle spaces proposed in the building and one loading space within the building is proposed. Vehicular access is to be solely off of Mountain Street at the north end of the site. Next slide, please. Again, I won't dwell too uh, much on the next few slides as they formed an integral component of Mr. Valentine's presentation. So. We'll just scroll through, scroll through them one at a time. This is Mountain Street again, looking south. Next slide, uh, off corner of Elman and Mountain, looking northeast. Uh, and again, the, uh, the plaza and, and the proposed community space within Wolverton Hall. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide uh, describes the process. Uh, which these applications have followed. Uh, we started with a pre-consultation meeting where um, the various review agencies uh, met with the applicants to determine what documentation would need to be submitted with the application in order to deem it complete. Uh, we proceeded to a, uh, a complete application submission, uh, which was then circulated to the public uh, in a couple of ways, uh, by way of the town's website on Let's Talk Grimsby, uh, the documents were posted on that site, and notices were sent out um, to area residents and landowners, and uh, an on-site sign was posted. Uh, the, uh, the applications and documentation were also circulated to various governmental agencies, external and internal, uh, for a technical review. Um, an open house was held on September 13th um, uh, to consider so that the public has an opportunity to consider and provide input to the proposed uh, uh, development. Uh, and then a statutory public meeting was held on December 16th, 2021. Uh, following that, uh, uh, there was staff analysis of policy and all comments that have been received from uh, the public and various agencies, uh, which brings us to tonight's meeting. Uh, uh, where um, the committee will consider staff's recommendation for these applications. Following tonight's meeting, there will be a uh, council meeting uh, where this committee's recommendation will be considered for a final decision. Next slide, please. Documents, <clears throat> documents that have been considered by the town and its review of the proposed applications include provincial policy statement, uh, growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, the Region of Niagara Official Plan, uh, the Niagara Escarpment Plan, uh, Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw, um, and support uh, supporting technical studies and reports, as well as comments and recommendations provided by internal departments, external review agencies, as I've noted, and the public also informed this review of these applications. Staff agree with our regional colleagues that uh, the applications are in conformity with the provincial and regional policy when they state that both regional and provincial policy place an emphasis on intensification and infill to foster the development of complete communities that have a mix of diverse land uses, housing choices, improved social equity and quality of life, new and expanded access to multiple forms of transportation, and the provision of spaces that are vibrant and resilient in their design. The Niagara Escarpment Commission also commented on the proposal's conformity with the Niagara Escarpment Plan as the subject plans fall within the Escarpment Urban designation of the Niagara Escarpment Plan. They have no objections to the approval of these applications. Next slide, please. 
major intensification areas highlighted here in, uh, in red uh, in the Grimsby official plan represent the two areas where the majority of intensification within Grimsby is to be directed. The town represents, or the, I'm sorry, the downtown represents one of the two major intensification areas, but it plays a more significant role in the municipal structure than simply as a location for intensification. In addition to being a major intensification area, the downtown is also intended to serve as the commercial center of the town, its meeting place and place of socialization, and as the recognized core of the entire municipality. The policies of the official plan and any amendments to the official plan must endeavor to strengthen these key strategic functions of the downtown. Next slide, please. The subject plans are within the downtown intensification designation. The official plan states that the intent, as was noted previously, of this designation is to provide opportunities for large scale commercial development, mixed use developments and or significant residential intensification. The downtown transition designation to the south provides a buffer to the sensitive low density residential areas further south of that designation. The proposal complies with the compatibility metrics established within the official plan, such as shadow impacts and angular planes. Other agency and in-house reviews supporting the proposed development include transportation and parking, which was reviewed by uh, the town transportation uh, specialist, uh, view shed study, which was reviewed by the Niagara Escarpment Plan uh, Commission staff, and urban design, uh, which was reviewed by uh, in consultation with town staff by the region of Niagara urban design staff. Next slide, please. This plan illustrates the step back design that uh, the proposed the proposal implements in order to minimize the uh, pedestrian scale impact on the public realm. Site specific provisions have been included in the draft zoning bylaw to ensure that these design elements are in essence locked in to regulation. Next slide, please. The applicants uh, have agreed um, uh, to subject this proposed, these proposed plans to a design review panel, as was noted previously, an urban design review panel will be convened and will consist of representatives from town planning, town heritage planning, regional urban design, Niagara escarpment commission staff, urban design consultants chosen by Grimsby staff, and the applicant's representatives. The panel is to convene prior to the formal submission of a site plan application. The panel's <clears throat> primary goals uh, will be to recommend additional elements uh, in the design, which would be designed to reduce the building's perceived massing from the public realm, reduce the visual impact on the Niagara escarpment, and ensure that new construction materials complement, but clearly differentiate from the retained heritage structures. Next slide, please. The proposal was reviewed by town uh, professional heritage staff, as well as Heritage uh, Grimsby Advisory Committee. A number of conditions were recommended. These conditions will be implemented by the development agreement following the conclusion of the site plan approval process. It should be noted that the Wolverton House and Wolverton Har Hall are not currently designated. However, the applicant has agreed to not object to the designation of both structures and has agreed uh, to a commemoration plan for uh, structures that are removed. Next slide, please. In summary, uh, following consideration of relevant policy and input from public and various agencies, staff recommend that the applications be approved and that the application for an official plan amendment, or sorry, the draft official plan amendment that is attached to the report as Appendix A, um, and that the draft zoning bylaw amendment that's attached to the report as Appendix B uh, be forwarded to Council at the following meeting uh, for approval. Thank you everyone for your time uh, and consideration, and I am available to answer any questions anybody might have. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Walter. Uh, Questions from Council? 
Councillor Dunstall. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, is do I understand that there is no commercial component within this new structure? Um, I'm just trying to figure out uh, with this plaza and what I saw conceptually that there's a lot of people sitting at tables with food in a plaza. And if there's no commercial component to this, where where do they plan on bringing this food from? Um, and where do these people that are, well, meeting at this plaza, parking in this uh, uh, in the area because there's no above ground parking it's all underground so uh, that that's one of my questions I, I don't know walter if it's you that would be answering that or if it would be one of the delegations yeah walter, the, it, thank you it, go ahead it, yeah I, I, it's uh, drew sinclair of SEN counselor i'm more than happy to answer that there is there is commercial uses within the development that wolverton house is proposed to actually return to a former use. It'll likely become a restaurant in its uh, in its new. So it's envisioned with um, the the southern side of the house being opened up to that cafe or patio seating area. On the on in the new building side. So when you're looking south in the plaza, uh, we had an image that showed to the left an open area, a retractable glass wall. That's anticipated to be a multi-purpose space. It's primarily resident amenity for the building. So there'll be required indoor amenity no, for, no for all the, the residents of the apartments. No, no commercial within that portion. So the plaza serves three different uses. On the south side, it serves the Wolverton, Wolverton Hall. So we anticipate for food programming, community programming, some of that spilling out into the plaza when, when planned to do so. So we're introducing new doors on the, uh, on the, the north side of Wolverton Hall and with the connecting element between that and the new building, access to the plaza. And then the amenity space that I mentioned before, which could potentially be additional community space, but it's primarily going to be resident amenity. And then on the north side of the plaza, so, uh, Drew, we, Drew, that there will be a small amount of commercial in the house. Drew, just to build on that yes. and Councillor Dunstall, um, what we aspire to is, is more of a cafe art gallery vibe, um, something that's not going to have a burdensome amount of um, uh, restaurant back of house requirements just because we can't support that. We know that. So in that image and the direction that we gave to the architects was build on that image of an opportunity for a community art gallery because art is very important to us. You know, we have artists right. and arts and studio program on site right now. So how can we build that out with a retail component and potentially have a cafe? So that's what's been envisioned in that artist interpretation. And as far as where they will park, um, you know, we are supporting um, uh, this residential program, community program with 102 parking spaces, 27 of which will be time of day shared parking spaces. So the way that breaks out is that those 27 spaces, um, let's say at noon, will serve both this gallery cafe function, the community hall function, and, and the residential require, uh, the residential visitor requirements of the building. Is this underground, these 27 spaces? Uh, they're all underground, counselor. They come at a great cost, about $100,000 of parking spots. Yeah, and yeah. well, that crossed my mind, too. It's a, it's a concrete structure. So, I, so with the Wolverton House, which is at the north end of the site, it looks like you're going to be chopping off the back end of it, which is where the kitchen was when it was originally uh, the Gable or the uh, 13 Mountain Street or the uh, Syndicate. Uh, so if you're reducing the size of the Wolverton House to what it originally was, uh, I, I, that's what confused me even more. Yes, no, how, do you, how, how do you make a cafe out of that when you've just, you've just taken a, a, a key part of the component out of the equation? So how does anybody happen to function inside a building that's been reduced dramatically in size? Maybe by fifty percent. I don't know. I'm just that's my just my. No, you're my absolutely person. right. We're go. We're we're looking at these heritage buildings in their first principle of design. Right. Because really, yeah. we feel that's where the architectural beauty is, and that's what we want to put on display. So that, we that your renderings look like that too. Yes. Yes. Right? Yeah. So okay. so you you are right. There's a when I when I spoke about us playing our strengths, retail, commercial is not our strength on this site. It's community, indoor, outdoor space, and a rental market building um, above. 
So um, I, I hope that's clear. Let us know if there's any other questions yeah. about yeah, that. I, just, just, to, just so you're building rental units, and I'm not mistaken, you said about seventy four. What what kind of rent do you think that you're going to be charging for a one or two bedroom or even a three bedroom rental unit at 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 the time of completion? What do you what do you is it going to be uh, as we like to say affordable to people with the construction of the underground parking being so expensive and in the in the uh, report or in the agenda I noticed that there was four other. Uh, addresses that are looked at when it came to parking, uh, like one and three Slesser, but these are all above grade parking lots that are not uh, two and a half stories deep, or you say two and a half levels, I should say. Uh, so I'm, I'm just thinking, is, is it going to be affordable to be able to rent there is it because of the, uh, the cost involved in building this facility? Councillor Dunstall, great question. This is not an affordable rental building. This is a market rentable build, market okay. rental building. But what that means is attainable. And this is an opportunity um, for those who can't afford to buy a home to still be able to find uh, a house here in Grimsby or an apartment here in downtown Grimsby. And what I mean by that is we are seeing construction costs um, at an all time high. We oh, are yes. seeing, and we are seeing um, a housing stock being depleted. Instead of having to, let's say, buy in at a similar condo product in the area at $1,000 a square foot, you're going to be able to find a leasing opportunity where you have to put first and last months up. And you're kind of probably going to be looking at a rate, you know, that will be set at a market time. But, you know, I would say it's going to be the rate around two to two and a half dollars a square foot. Mm -hmm. and, and that's my honest opinion. And, and that is that is what reflective <laughs> um, of what the current rental market condition is in Grimsby, which is currently built by investor rental buildings or condo buildings, as we see in, in the likes of Grimsby on the lake. Yeah, yeah. So you're looking at two thousand to twenty five hundred dollars a month in, in, in that range. Budget, in that range, and yeah. something and large. No, two bedroom. Okay. Most of the units are uh, two and three bedrooms, um, so uh, over fifty percent. Uh, it's actually close to sixty percent. Okay, all right. So Thank you. if I could add to that, just to, to, to com make a comment on, on exactly what you suggested there, Councillor, with regard to the affordability, the median household income in Grimsby is, is in the mid $90,000 range. And, and the, the, the CMHC definition of affordability tends to peg um, rental or what's paid for shelter on a monthly basis at 30% of the monthly income in a household. Yes. So the rental you spoke about there, I mean, the average rents for these within within Grimsby today is right in the absolute middle of the affordability threshold for the average family in the, the, the town of Grimsby. So a lot of the, the thinking of, about what's coming here is attainable housing that will provide housing for you know, needed rental units that fall exactly within that, that market range uh, for the, the, the average family within the town of Grimsby. Okay, thank you. No more questions right now. Councillor Cadwell. Thank you, uh, Mayor Jordan, and uh, thank you to, uh, to the people involved with this development uh, for your presentation. Uh, I like the community amenities that you're proposing. I think it's great for the downtown uh, area there to have a, a spot where, where people can congregate and, uh, and just enjoy the area there. Uh, as I was listening to your presentation and watching, just thinking of what comes to mind is, is your, all that, uh, that courtyard area, Mountain Street is a very busy street. A lot of trucks going up and down, uh, Jake breaks, constantly making noises. I know there's a, there's a stop sign where, you know, as they, as they pull away, say they're heading north, you won't be hearing a Jake break, uh, either going down or going up. A uh, lot of traffic, a lot of a lot of noise, and I'm just wondering how, with that courtyard area, how that's going to be uh, mitigated, uh, so to speak. Because I know uh, uh, there's times when you're sitting out on Main Street at the patios, and if a large truck goes by, it's pretty noisy. You're, uh, anyways, you're a lot closer there, but uh, yeah, that's something that just came to mind. Uh, I'd say I like the idea, but uh, I think there's going to be a lot of challenges. A lot of your, uh, most of your rendering drawings 
showed no hydro wires on Mountain Street from, from Elm Street heading north. Uh, the hydro wires, it's uh, high voltage. Uh, you know, part of it's coming down from our substation up on the mountain for our community. So who's going to pay to have the hydro put underground? That's the question I have. Uh, is that the developer that's going to pay for that? Uh, I think that would be, uh, again, that would be quite a large expense because of the, uh, the, uh, the high voltage and everything, uh, primary and secondary uh, lines that are on, that, on those poles. I just remember when we had the fire at the Gables, uh, that was a big challenge, fighting that Gables, that house fire at the restaurant was getting the quint positioned in a way that it wasn't going to be close to the hydro wire. So again, just looking at, at a lot of those pictures just came to mind. So that's the question I have there. Um, the, um, I, I'm glad Council Dunstall brought up about the rent rental rates proposed because I was something I was thinking about too. Um, I just I wrote a whole bunch of stuff down, so I apologize. Just give me a little bit while I'm just checking through my notes. The carriage house is that going to be demolished? Uh, that's right. I'm sorry. Do you want me to answer that? Uh, that's right. It's part, the Heritage Committee has uh, we've entered into a number of conditions and precedents, including a commemorative plan that will commemorate um, the carriage house. It will come down as part of the redevelopment. Yeah, I just had a. Uh... <laughs> A brain, uh, I thought, gee, it's too bad you couldn't move that carriage house. Because I think back to the city of Burlington, the train station, when I worked there, they, they moved the train station, they, they saved the train station, and they put it, I, Councillor Ritchie can help me on this one, but I believe it's next to, on Fairview, next to the headquarters fire station. So has there been any consideration on trying to save that, that house, and maybe possibly could it be moved, uh, Harley? And the location I was just thinking about was uh, there's a vacant lot across from the Pioneer gas station on our main street where the old George Lang's house used to be. So anyways. Yeah, we, we, we've, entered into, Harley, we've entered into a, a commemorative plan. And what we look to do, Councillor, is not move it, but salvage historically relevant artifacts from that carriage house and look to repurpose them within the development. Um, the, the, the structure itself is not sound, uh, Councillor Cadwell. I, I don't think that um, I don't think it merits a relocation. And, and Heritage Committee has supported us on the salvage plan. So, um, uh, listen, heritage is is important for us, and I think we've got two great landmark beauties that that we're going to put our resources and our energies into commemorating um, and, 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 and as preserving in the round. And just to comment on your earlier um, question. Um, our proposal is widening Mountain Street as per the regional direction. So we're making some streetscape improvements there. Um, in terms of um, the um, dealing with the hydro um, pools, that's still for discussion. Um, we haven't, um, we've, we've identified it, the region's identified it, the towns have identified it. That's a, kind of a level of detail that will be sorted through the next round, which is a site plan approval process. And then in terms of uh, noise impact, we did retain a noise and vibration consultant and we prepared a report and specifically looking at um, the type of environment that we're creating in the plaza space and ensuring that it's gonna be welcoming for people to uh, sit and stand and um, just recreate at all times of the year. Based on those findings, we will need to deal with some mitigation measures. Um, the mitigation, um, even with the right of way widening, so now, um, you know, the, the step back from the street is actually uh, further away because we're increasing the sidewalk um, dimension. That said, through landscaping, through potential um, other um, sites, uh, conditions. We'll we'll be looking at that in detail in the next round, and that's something we're very attuned to. And we do have um, a technical consultant advising us to ensure that um, that environment is going to be well used and um, also going to be um, a, you know a space that people do want to um, visit and and hang out in. 
Thank you, uh, Elsa. Um, yeah, I, I was hoping to get maybe an answer to the, and I understand what you're saying with the site plans, what all evolves around that, uh, with the uh, under, with the uh, making the overhead hydro, actually making it to underground hydro, because I was uh, mm -hmm. thinking back when, uh, when Brent Haven, uh, maybe Councilor Dunstall and, and staff can help me out here, maybe Mr. Basic, that I believe the developer had to pay for a lot of that underground hydro to be done at uh, Grimsby at the lake. Uh, I may be wrong on that, but I thought that was part of it's the- usually, agreement. so typically like um, for large plans of subdivision, um, you're dealing with major streetscape improvements and that's typically secured through the draft plan process. It's typically not secured through um, smaller kind of infill projects. That said, we haven't had an opportunity to kind of um, discuss in a wholesome way um, with both the region and the town. But, but Councillor Catwell, just to echo your concerns and also vision for an improved streetscape, it's of high interest for us to bury those hydro lines. It's also of high interest to clean up some of that signage that currently exists on the corner of Mountain Elm. It, it, there, there's no discipline or structure to between the hydro poles and, and, and the crosswalks and, and the stoplights. So we look forward to uh, continuing conversations with the region and the town about how we can improve that condition. And I think it, what's important for us as well is to build for the future. Even though those trucks are here today and they may they may be through here on my lifetime, but maybe not my children's lifetime. And we want to build for the next hundred years and protect for that opportunity to have, you know, an exceptional public realm space at the at the foot of the escarpment at the gateway to downtown Grimsby. Very important for us. Yeah, thanks, Harley, for your comments on that with the trucks, because uh, at the Roma conference, uh, we had a meeting with Minister Mulroney and uh, Unfortunately, the uh, truck road is not even on the white paper yet from the from the province. Which uh, your children, maybe my grandchildren's children, it, it can't happen soon enough, Harley, to get the trucks. But anyways, thank you for that. Those comments. Um, a couple more things, and I and I, I'll leave it because I don't want to take too much time here. But I may be back. Um, with regards to the parking, um, you're not you're not meeting the minimum requirement of parking at this time. And I've got some concerns there because I know, I, I know some of the businesses are, you know, not that they're not they're not anti-development at all. I know that because I, uh, I had some meetings, but uh, they're concerned about some of the parking spots that that are used for the, you know, on Balsam Lane there and all that that could be uh, uh, taken up, you know, periodically. I don't know, if, you know, again that. With the with the uh, not meeting the minimum parking, I, I've got some issues with that. So uh, uh, the other thing I'm just going to touch on is is you mentioned bicycle. Is that are you is your units going to have a spot for people? To, uh, just, I'll just be quick on that then. Just it's just bicycles. Are they going to be stored in people's apartments? Is that the idea? Because you mentioned 73 spots or something like that for bicycles. Yeah, yes, we have. To, or Drew, you want to talk about our exceptional bicycle storage room? <laughs> I'm excited. I am very yeah, excited. I want to hear it. Bicycle storage. <laughs> we have an exceptional bicycle. No, there's actually a dedicated bicycle storage garage within the building. So accessible for residents and for visitors. We have indoor bicycle storage of that quantum. That's not that's completely outside the units. So, I mean, the, we hear the comments on the parking and we understand that it does raise concern when we're moving away from the bylaw. But what we've done is spend a lot of time working with our traffic consultant trying to understand what the likely use of the parking is. And I, I can only speak from their expertise, but also our experience in building rental buildings in places like Collingwood and Orangeville. And, you know, right now in Markham and other centers is that the, the rental rates, the, the, the parking we're providing will will likely not be used even in the amount that's being supplied by the rental residents on site. It will be used for some of the commercial uses and visitors for sure. But we do anticipate an enormous amount of walking traffic coming from this building with, with people living next to or near to downtown. And, and that's kind of proven out when rental housing is built close to historic main streets and small towns. Um, you know, there, there is often a lot of anxiety about lowering parking rates, especially when building this kind of infill project in in and near you know historic main streets and i think what we're trying to to do is kind of help begin to transition downtown into a walking community again but at the same time providing more than enough parking for the use and, and the people that are going to be living in the building um the bicycle parking you know certainly you know, there's there's i mean i'm a cyclist and I, I ride a lot and uh you know but it's a pain in the ass to take my like am i am i allowed to say ass i'm called anyway it is a pain in the ass to take your bicycle 
up to your apartment and then bring it down. So having a, a really great accessible bicycle, bicycle parking space assures that people will use it safe and save their, their bicycle safely, store their bicycle Drew, safely in the building. Great. Drew, we do have Stephanie here. So I don't know, Stephanie, if you do want to. Oh, I didn't see her on here. Yeah, yeah. Stephanie, maybe you can come. Yeah, so Drew, you did a pretty good job, you know, so I'll just add <laughs> it to it as well too. Um, so uh, my name is Stephanie Hardis. I work for BA Group. Uh, we are the uh, transportation consultant for the applicant. Uh, just to give you a sense and some, uh, like a sense of security, we did look. We did spend a great deal of time, sort of looking at parking, trying to come up with the right number of parking. So as Drew said, is our what we're trying to do? Yes, we have a reduced parking ratio. Yes, we are asking for a reduction in residential parking and residential visitor visitor parking. That's sort of what we're asking for. Um, in in terms of like the process and what we have taken a look at is we have looked at a number of things. One is there is the rental nature of the proposed development does sort of yield to, and, and this is sort of what we're seeing from our experience as well too, is rental buildings typically have a lower parking ratio than a condominium building. Um, one of the reasons why too is with a rental building, you're not selling a, you, with a condominium building, you usually unitize sort of parking spaces. So a parking space is sold for e each individual unit. So whether or not you have a parking space or not, you know, like it, it goes per, per unit. Whereas with the, with a with the rental building, the beauty of it is it's provided in one big pooled parking. So you can provide parking to where you need it. Um, and so it does move around. So it does move around per unit. And, and that's sort of one of the, one of the reasons why um, like a rental building typically has a lower sort of uh, a parking ratio to, to it uh, in comparison to a condominium building. Um, we also did look at uh, the trends within the Niagara region. So just from a uh, it, just looking at other parking standards, you have St. Catharines that does not have any minimum parking. Um, if we're looking at other sort of municipalities too, they're kind of moving away from um, sort of higher parking standards and looking at what, you know, looking at putting, providing what you need um, from, a, from, a, a pers uh, from a parking perspective that also puts the emphasis on walking, cycling, um, taking transit and creating that, that sort of that sort of infrastructure in order to do so. Uh, you also have the town of Niagara that has a parking requirement of one per unit, which is what we are being what we are asking for. We also I, I just want to focus in on that for a moment and, and just reiterate that Grimsby's bylaw does not have a carve out or um, a lens to put on rental buildings. Neither has anyone on council in the past 40 years reviewed a rental building or voted on a rental building. So it sort of speaks towards um, uh, our inability to properly uh, evaluate this project. Uh, in Niagara on the Lake, they have a carve out for the bylaw for rental buildings, and that is one for one. Um, Stephanie has also done um, a study within Grimsby, and she did a very interesting study. She went to three rental buildings at 3 a.m. in the morning. And why she was there at 3 a.m. in the morning is because she was counting cars. She found that the count of cars was proportionate to the amount of what the users required for per unit basis. And the numbers were from 0.7 to 1. So we feel 1 is actually, it's actually at the high end of the spectrum of requirements for per unit um, requirement in a rental building. Um, so, you know, Councillor Cadwell, when you spoke about Slesser and you spoke about the surface parking, Yes, they have a very organized surface parking program, but when Stephanie was there at 3 a.m., the demand did not exceed one per unit. So that is sort of what we're taking as our threshold. And as Drew echoed and our team has echoed a number of times with this uh, community and council is that it, it is fluid and we control it. And we may, you know, if you put your mother there or, you put, or your, your kids come into this building, they may not need, need a car. And, and you know what, they'll probably be, um, and owners cost the lease of space as well. So that's something else uh, the potential new tenants of this building will have to put as a consideration to be a part of this community. And it also gives them an opportunity to not have the burden of some costs to carry cars or to carry the costs associated with cars. So um, I, there, there's, there's just so many positives and, and, and uh, we're, we're here to spend as much time as needed on it, but we, we feel really positive that uh, we're actually building too much parking in a lot of ways. Um, so 
Um, and, and our studies and our technical experts sort of have to back that up. So sorry to cut you off, Stephanie. Is there anything further to sort of add on that? Yeah, I'd also I'd also sort of add too is we did take a look at sort of other approvals within the town of Grimsby, and we noticed that there are there have been other reduction of parking spaces that have been approved. In particular, I would sort of note to 65 Main Street has been approved at one per unit, um, so one space per unit, which is what we've been asking for. That's not that far away from our from our site here. Um, it's within the downtown area, so I think it's it's sort of a, it speaks to that same context. I'd also sort of like want to sort of point out that our site has a we're proposing a what we call transportation demand management strategies. What these are is it's it's sort of strategies that's helping reduce sort of um, you know vehicle dependencies. And one of one of the commitments that the site is uh, looking at doing is providing um, like uh, NRT, which is the Niagara Region Transit Service, on demand transport uh, transportation passes um, to the residents to provide a discount to the residents to make it um, even more sort of desirable to encourage the use of sort of transit and other uses. In terms of um, Drew's point, there are 84 bicycle parking spaces. Um, so there is quite a bit of bicycle parking that we're also providing um, to the site as well. I hope that answers your question. Thank you for the answers. Uh, I'm done for now, Mark. Thank you. Answer Vardy. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've got a few questions, so maybe if they could be answered as, as uh, I'm going through them, I'd appreciate it. And I'll just say right off the top, I've been um, uh, very conflicted about this uh, development because I can see many, many positives in it and also uh, concerns about it. So um, that's kind of where I'm coming from right now. Um, I, I know that you've partnered with GBF and I uh, on, on various uh, initiatives. I know that... Um, uh, you're going to be using market rates uh, for for this development. So what I'd like to know is, have you had any discussions with GBF about how you might partner with them uh, on on the apartments that are that are being built? I understand they they do a kind of rent subsidy in a way um, to assist people. Do you see that happening there? Thank you, Councillor Vardy. Um, uh, the GBF obviously is a committed community partner. We're aspirational to enter into a long-term lease um, to maintain them on the site and allow them to continue to explore the expansion of their um, services um, in the wellness and mental health um, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the wellness and mental health world. Um, as far as the rental subsidy program goes, we know it very well. We currently contribute to that program. And we also contribute to the GBF through a complete free use um, of that space. So we are making a considerable contribution to their program. We look forward to continue to become a strategic partner with them on their subsidy program. But I'm not certain, and there's been no discussions about their participation in um, the rental market uh, suites that we will provide. However, I do know quite a bit about the program. The way the program works is it's not, unfortunately, it's, it's a bit... Um, of a, a response, uh, and it's not necessarily a, um, a program that plans for the future. So those that are in need, and those that are in need are coming out of places like the Slesser Apartments, like uh, Winston Road Developments, new condo built forums, where, where people are struggling to pay their rent. They show up at Stacy's door, and she puts them through a program to step in to get them back on their feet and to cover their rent. So they currently don't have a system in place to proactively target units. It's more of a um, it's more of a soft landing for those that are having a difficult time and to get them back up on their feet. Okay, and uh, if through you, Mr. Mayor, to Harley, um, how how do the rents compare to say Slesser? I know you've given a, a cost per square foot. Um, are they comparable to Slesser? I'm assuming that Slesser is also market rates. Slesser is market rates. Um, you know, Slesser's own, it used to be a family owned uh, apartment building, believe it or not, for probably, um, I don't know, 30, 30, until about five years ago, it was sold to a pension fund. 
So what that means is a pension fund owns that they're going to run it at you know the lowest common uh, you know it, it, standard as far as landlordship goes, and they're going to look for fair market value rates. So um, they're going to obviously it, the introduction of our building. It's going to be a bit more competitive. We're going to have a lot more amenity and a lot more offer as far as our connectivity to downtown Guernsey, but. The rates will be set at the time that the building is built and it'll be a market rate. So I would look at today's rate, you can look at inflation and sort of make a calculation of when we deliver the building. Okay, so and really just to build on what you were just saying that we plan to own and manage the building as well. Um, so that's um, just to ensure a high quality um, uh, rental unit and, and overall program. Okay. Um, I'd I'd like to know how much have you invested so far in the uh, two heritage buildings? Oh. I, I've seen uh, that point of order, Jordan. Going in when it was a pool hall. So. Mayor Jordan, can I ask for a point of order? Go ahead, Councillor Sharp. Are we on the delegation or are we on the staff report? Well, yeah, we should be on the staff report. Um, so we are on the staff report? Yeah. Can we direct the questions to staff and, and have not as much yeah. discussion with the developer? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Sharp. Thank you, Mayor Jordan. Okay. Um, maybe Apologies, Scott. it's just making this uh, really drawn out. We've been going since 6.39 on this topic. And it's almost eight o'clock. Yeah, well, I have a few questions and I think people so would like Council to know Barty, the answer. We're on the staff report. You have to ask staff, if you, not the developer, but. All Mayor right, Jordan, thank you, you thank you, thank you. Point taken. Um, how will traffic be routed in and out of the building? Uh, the traffic is demonstrated in our site plan. It's a uh, it, it's an entrance off Mountain Street that currently exists. So we'll be making use of the existing curb cut that provides entrance to 13 Mountain Street, and it'll be a quick uh, decline into our underground parking and a convenient delivery to our tenants' parking spot and or our commercial tenants' uh, use of uh, the time of day shared parking. So how do they exit? Same way. They will exit the exact same way. It'll be a, it'll be a, a two way um, a, a two way lane uh, that is built to a, a standard uh, condition. Uh, Drew, I don't know if you want to comment on sort of how and effectively that grade change works, and we're going to take cars under the building. Okay, so basically just in and out of Mountain, right? That's the only way. That, that's Tuck, correct. Council. Tucked it down and quick. Okay, and my next question is, if uh, you'll indulge me, how are you? You talked about a loading area, or there was discussion of a loading area. Where is the garbage picked up? It's a great question. Yes, Water Mayor Gordon. Yes, Councillor Ritchie. Uh, well, um, Walter, you'll be able to answer these questions, and, and you, are, you are our Walter staff. And that's fine. So, Walter, you can answer them. Yeah, thank Thanks, you. Walter. Three, three, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I would presume that the loading, we didn't get into that uh, in detail uh, as of yet, but uh, the loading space could serve the function of loading and unloading uh, of people when they move in, move out, uh, as well as serving the, the, the non-residential components of the building, as well as uh, providing a location for uh, waste collection. So Walter, how does garbage get picked up? Just so I understand. It will have to be a private collection. Okay, but would it be underneath the building or outside somewhere or? Uh, Again, these, are, these aren't details uh, that we've worked out yet, but there is a space within the building where uh, waste collection can occur. Uh, and when we get to the site plan stage, these are the types of details that we'll address. Okay, and uh, if you can answer this for me, um, Walter, um, how much are the development charges for this uh, proposal? Um, I haven't checked them most recently, but uh, including regional and local development charges, uh, we're probably talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of $15,000 a unit. 1.7 million is what we have on our sheet. Right. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Councillor Frank. Uh, thank you, Mayor Jordan. I, I think that most of my questions have been answered uh, and some of the questions I have would have been directed to the delegation. So uh, I guess, is it okay if I just <clears throat> some comments about this particular development without someone calling point of order? 
Go ahead, Councillor Frick. Thank you. Anyways, you know, we, we in, the, in the past couple of years, we, we've approved a number of high rise buildings in town. And, you know, I was, I'm, not, I'm not a big uh, supporter of high rise towers. However, when I look at the Casablanca area, when the Casablanca hotel development was, was, was first tabled, I was totally against it. But you know something, I found something in that development that really, really made me excited. And that was the fact they were gonna put another hotel in, which is badly needed in Grimsby, without a question. Then Lasani Village down on, which is now the fifth, uh, fifth wheel. I mean, I was not in favor of that and I, and I probably still would vote against it to a certain degree. But you know something, when Mr. Lasani took me down to the site and, and the rest of us down to the site and we saw what he was doing, and we looked at the community village type of affair he was building on the beach. I was in favor of that building. So I now, so that's two buildings that I was against. Now, this case is a seven story building. My big support and my big thing about this is it's a rental building, which is really badly needed in this town. It's badly needed in the Niagara area. It's badly needed in the DTHA area. Would I be willing to? Sorry, did someone say something? Would I be willing to sacrifice seven stories and a few parking spaces for an opportunity to bring a really good bunch of quality rentals into Grimsby? Absolutely. Is the location right? Absolutely it's right. And, you know, I think that the faster we, we get to this, because, you know, we are right now, we're trailblazers if we approve this building. Uh, and, you know, I, I think we really need to look at this through the eyes of what the town needs, and it needs good quality rentals. Yes, people in this, in this town can rent from condominium investors. It'll cost them. If they rent a condominium, hey, six months from now, the owner of that, invest, that invested in that condominium could throw them out and put somebody else in. You know, I, when I campaigned, I, I, I actually spoke to a number of people who had in-laws living in their basement, wanted to bring their kids home, I talked to you know, older people who wanted to sell their homes and just rent, but they couldn't find any place. So we are going to be put in a position in Grimsby and we'll be one of the first to do it to allow that type of demand to be fulfilled. So yes, I will, I will, I will support this because, and I will sacrifice the seven stories and a few parking spaces to get this really fantastic quality development in the town. And I'll leave it at that because the questions I have uh, would really be more directed at, at the delegation. And I think most of my questions that I would have asked were asked already by the other councillors. And I thank them for that. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank the delegation very, very much. And I wish you all the luck. And uh, thank you, Walter, for the presentation as well. So that's as much as I can say right now, uh, Mayor Jordan. And thank you for the opportunity to talk. Councillor Bothwell. Thank you, Mayor Jordan. Um, I have a few questions for staff first, if you'll uh, me. Uh, Walter, um, the Village Square. I'm excited about the development. I think that the, um, the applicant has done a great job of reaching out to the community um, to explain his proposal uh, through a number of uh, meetings, as well as keeping an, uh, uh, opening it up for further engagement. Um, I think it's exciting and vibrant. We'll bring people down to the downtown and we need to keep our, our, our downtown vibrant. The village square portion of it is exciting where it's um, fronting on to the sidewalk. Is that um, under the official plan, it talks about where um, in the downtown transition and downtown intensification designations um, that uh, there has to be village square. All development applications on sites greater than 0.2 hectares shall include a location for a village square. And village squares are intended as formal pedestrian spaces in support of the adjacent higher density mixed use development. It also says that um, where appropriate, the town may accept privately owned village squares as fulfilling all or part of the required parkland dedication whether or not the land is dedicated to the town and then it's subject to an agreement. Could you please clarify if um, this village square or town square is private or public? And if it is gonna be part of the parkland dedication and if you see it as being um, an agreement with the town for its use. I just wanna ensure that it's an area that will um, be and continue to be available for public use. Thank you for your question, Councillor Bothwell, for you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you've accurately depicted the policy that's in the official plan. Uh, that is an issue 
the, the, the village square is being proposed. Um, it, it will be cemented in, in terms of uh, requiring that open space by virtue of a setback that we've incorporated into the draft zoning bylaw for uh, new construction from Mountain Street. Uh, but uh, whether it's right now, it's uh, not being proposed as a public village square. Um, so I'm presuming that it is private. Uh, we haven't specifically come to any kind of an agreement on that, uh, but it's something that you would normally address through the site plan review process uh, by virtue of the agreement and uh, any dedications that would be associated with that, uh, uh, the development. I just don't want to lose that opportunity with the zoning. If we need to ensure that it um, is available with public space, I, I just wondered if that needs to be put into the zoning bylaw as um, a village square as, a, as an intended use. Is that something we have to think about now or not? Village squares are permitted in any zone. Okay. Uh, uses like that are permitted in every zone. So we don't need a specific zone to permit it. Uh, but again, it's it's something that uh, uh, every development will have to contribute towards parkland one way or another. And, you know, if it's not land, it's cash, right? So uh, it's something that we'll address uh, through the safe planning process. I just think that's a really critical piece is making sure that it is um, considering the uh, that it is publicly available. Um, the parking spaces, because of the deficiency in parking, the Official plan also talks about um, where a developer doesn't wish to provide all the required parking spaces. The town may at its discretion accept cash in lieu. Um, this is only in the downtown district area that that, um, uh, that section applies. Can you tell me whether or not the town will be asking for uh, cash in lieu of the deficiency of the required parking spaces? Because those, and it also says those funds raised can be used by the town towards the purchase of property for public parking. The recommendation of staff is to reduce the zoning requirement for parking. So, and not to require that the applicant provide funds to cover that deficiency? That's correct. So the studies uh, that have been submitted and, uh, and, and subsequent uh, addendums to the study uh, as reviewed by staff, have determined that the amount of parking that's being provided is sufficient for the proposed uses on the site. So that's the appropriate zoning standard for this, this development. Thank you. Um, can you confirm just, um, I, I know we went over the, uh, the official plan and the zoning that this particular development is in an intensification area for the downtown. The downtown district is all a designated intensification area. And there are three separate distinct districts. And I'm very conscious of the Main Street corridor um, and the Main Street uh, designation in the downtown where it has a height maximum of four stories. Um, and three on the south on the south side, I believe, with a view uh, a, a view shed study. But I'm very cognizant of that four stories on the downtown Main Street, and that's why the no more than four is really important to me to maintain the historic um, Main Street. The downtown and intensification um, districts allow for language in the official plan where council may. Um, uh, provide assistance. council may in consultation with the Niagara Escarpment Commission consider building up to six stories provided visual impact assessment is submitted in the, in the angular planes and that it's demonstrated that views of the escarpment are not, not detrimentally impacted. I'm just to me that was really important and I just want if you could reiterate the Niagara Escarpment Commission actually reviewed the seven story building and found there was no detrimental impact and supported the development on that basis as long as they're um, partners in the site plan and looking at other ways to mitigate the massing and bulk. I just want if you could confirm that and that the transition and intensification areas are the only two areas that that height, um, the six stories in that language is applicable. It doesn't apply to the Main Street downtown. Is that correct? That's correct. The, uh, the maximum height requirement on uh, downtown Main Street is four stories. Um, and as you correctly noted, uh, the policy for the intensification designation is up to six stories subject to a view shed study. And again, the, the Niagara Scarpment Commission was actively involved in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, 
uh, development of these policies when the plan was originally adopted, as well as the zoning regulations. Um, and the zoning regulation is what it is, specifically to enable them to be involved in any, any buildings that are above three stories in height in the intensification uh, zoning category. So uh, this is something that, uh, or sorry, four stories, I'm sorry. Uh, this is something that they specifically asked for to be a part of, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and they are through the planning uh, application process, and uh, they will actively be involved again uh, through, uh, at our invitation, not, not something that they asked for, but at our invitation uh, through the uh, 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 design review panel process that we'll be implementing again prior to the submission of site plan. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. It's just, um, so I think that covers most of my questions. Um, the only thing that another comment I have is that I appreciate in your report under urban design that you do talk about the scale and bulk from the east and west public realms, however, maintains some serious bulk that will have to be minimized visually with the strategic use of materials and color. And this will be an element for the site and uh, design review panel. So I think it's just, um, I think those are critical pieces of the site plan that I hope when it comes back to council, we'll see some further refinement by the developer on, on how we can minimize that human scale um, from the street looking at, at the height and massing because it is a large building. Um, but because the Niagara Scarpment Commission, you know, has basically said that they're in support of it, council has the ability in the official plan to permit um, up to six. And this is one story above with, although I have, again, serious issues with the parking deficiency, I recognize that it's not something that you win at the OLT going with the parking deficiency or one story above what our official plan says. But I also recognize that as, as council, we have a responsibility to the businesses downtown to ensure adequate parking for public um, for the, the public to uh, visit and uh, those commercial establishments. So I think put it in the, which we just did, we put in the budget to do a um, parking study for the downtown and Grimsby on the lake and a transportation master plan. So that is critical. I had hoped we could have got it when I asked for it in 2019. I'm glad to see that parking study is now in the budget. And it's too bad that it's not uh, prior to some of this intensification because it would have helped us form a framework as we're looking at this, this uh, the growth that we're gonna see coming. Cause this is probably the beginning of more intensification in this area. So um, I just look forward to how staff will work with um, council and with uh, Public Works as we, we try to develop that parking strategy for this critical downtown intensification. Um, so yeah, I, I, just, I just think that's, that's really important um, as we move forward. Thank you. Councilor Sharp. <clears throat> Thanks, Mayor Jordan. Um, so I just wanted to start out talking about this building in 2018, we had an application about 200 meters away from here for the Century Condos. That was an eight-story building just down at basically at the end of Elm Street. And um, none of these, except for Councillor Cadwell and uh, Dunstall, were, were on the council at the time. It was before the last election. There was, we had to have the fire code. Like, there was so many people that came to Town Hall in opposition to that eight-story building. They literally... They open the gates, they stack chairs back to the to the desk, and um, they had to tell people to wait outside they, because of fire capacity in town hall. There was so many people that came and said, no, keep our downtown small scale and keep it. They wanted us to follow our official plan. And so I know my colleague here is talking about um, that in this downtown intensification area that we allow six stories, but we don't. As a right, we allow four stories, and we can make consideration for up to six stories. But this application is for seven stories. It's not for six stories. It's not for four stories. It's for seven stories. And so when we have to make consideration, I mean, I'm a representative of the people that live in the town, and four stories as of right is allowed. And so we have to consider, okay, do we allow six stories? we got to look at, okay, can a six-story building fit on this site? Okay, what, how do we determine does a, a building fit? We look at, do we need things like parking? Do we need things like um, outdoor space for the residents? And, and then we, we got to look at the 0.3 hectare, which is like three quarters of an acre. It's not even a one acre property. 
And um, we have to consider, okay, is six stories acceptable? And the answer is no, it's not. So, and that's six stories. It, we don't, we aren't even, the official plan doesn't even have any language about seven stories on this property. And we've seen, we went, the town came in hordes to town hall for eight stories, 200 meters down the road. They said, no way. And I had my colleague, Councillor Bothwell, and I both brought signs to that meeting. And I sat near her, or maybe with her, and we had signs that said, heritage, not high rises. And we had signs that said, no more than four. And those signs, they were red and they had white letters on them. You guys might remember them. And uh, there was a lot of the people that are on this call right now were probably at that meeting. And so now to see my colleagues say like, well, hey, this is okay. Seven stories is like a story, one less than eight. And like, I just can't believe it. But I'm ranting on this. I, I did write a few things down. Um, I wanted to talk about the owner of the pool hall. And there was a comment made earlier that the pool hall was struggling. Um, they have actually restored a building by the old train station. And uh, they are going to reopen the pool hall. The pool hall was not struggling. And I was a patron. I went to the different strokes. And, and I'm really excited to go when they open up. They, they've restored a heritage building by the old by the train tracks across from where the depot and they have a restaurant in there and they're going to have a pool. And I mean, obviously COVID keeps things from opening and but there was no, to my knowledge, they've moved to a new location and, and improved their, their business. So I, so I don't think the pool hall was struggling. Um, so we already talked a little bit about that. The seven-story building doesn't meet the merits. It's 26 spaces deficient on parking. And so right next door, directly adjacent to this, is a municipal parking lot. And so currently, we have parking issues down at Grimsby on the lake. And I get some residents, and they call in earnest, and they say, Counselor, can we get a street permit? Can we please, can you please find us somewhere to park? I get people calling me from uh, Magnolia and from Gage and from... Uh, those areas around Livingston and they're like, where can we park it? And the problem is that we didn't plan for it. So now the buildings are built. There's nothing we can do. What are we going to pave their front lawns or, or tear down a few houses or townhouses and move the existing ones? We do just can't. So the answer that I have to give these people is I'm sorry, this needed to be done at the planning stage. And so right now we are in that planning stage and we need to be thinking ahead about our downtown. Um, we talk a bit about affordable housing and um, I'm here in between $2,000 and $2,500 a month plus parking. And it sounds like the parking is gonna be expensive because there's only so much supply on the site. So um, they talk a little bit about people with uh, $90,000 incomes. And um, I'm not sure if those are gonna be the tenants of these buildings. I mean, you might need to have a $90,000 income and Grimsby's income is fairly high because we have a lot of commuters. They're uh, heading out of town and they drive to get out of town. We don't have a go train here. Our, our transit, like we've had for the past two years, this rideshare program is doing great. Um, I just don't know if it's sufficient to get two people to work from one of these two or three bedrooms. I also wonder when you have a two bedroom, if you maybe have two couples that live in it, right? Sometimes people share rent, it's expensive. And um, you might have four cars. I know we we need to focus on what our minimum standards are, but the standards require a certain amount. They This building doesn't meet it. So I posted online on Facebook about this yesterday and I asked for some feedback and I got a lot of the same responses saying no. This is not what we want downtown. We want to see small scale, low rise. And our official plan talks about mid rise, high rise, and low rise. And um, mid rise is five to 11 stories. That's what this building is. High rise is over 12 stories. And low rise is four stories or less. And I think that our downtown, we need to set the bar right now at four stories or less. We need a low rise downtown. There is some room in our zoning or official plan to allow up to six stories but on this site i don't think it's the right spot maybe there's some areas by the train tracks maybe there are some areas where it is this is 
right at the corner of a main intersection. And um, my vote will be no. And I, and I think that that's what the residents want. And I, and I want to be able to, to stand up for our downtown. So with that, I'm going to close. Thanks, Mayor Jordan. And um, thank you to my colleagues. Thank you, Councillor Sharp. And just, just a small point of clarification that the Main Street it, Main Street spot where Century Condos uh, is, is actually zoned different than this area in our official plan. Councillor Frake. Oh, sorry, Councillor Dunstall. Oh, no, you have spoke. So, Councillor Frake. Thank you, Mayor Jordan. I just had a question for probably Harry. I don't know if Walter can answer this question. It was Is there a way of um, analyzing the type of industry or commerce that will be generated by 73 units, 150 people living in the downtown area. I mean, is this something that we, we, we have a formula to do? I mean, I mean, when you have that many people downtown who can just walk to, you know, restaurants and grocery shops and so on and so forth, is, is there a way of calculating, you know, the type of commerce that this particular development will bring to town? Is Harry there or not? He's there somewhere, I'm sure. There he is. Thank you. Through like, you like, Merida, like your comments yeah. on that, Harry, if you don't mind. Through you, Merida, Councilor Freak. The, the only thing, we, there is no correlation to that sort of scientific correlation. The only thing I can say is that in our economic roundtable discussions with 20 chief executive officers of current business businesses in our community, they all talked about we need different housing mix to attract top talent, and we need um, different housing mixes to retain their top talent that they have. And that included companies like John Deere, Forty Creek. They all said, you know, we need a specific different types of housing mixes to retain our top talent. So I assume can't give you a scientific correlation. To, so to can that. I assume then that they're talking about, you know, Workers coming here to work to work with you know don't want to don't have a down payment on a house can't afford a house, you know don't want to don't want to you know can't afford to, to to lease a condominium on the lake whatever because those things are really expensive as well. I mean they're twenty five hundred plus for a small bedroom, uh, so so I guess they're speaking about in, in your roundtable talks about rentals, uh, because young people who want to come work for John Deere for example in Grimsby, I'm sure they can't afford to put a down payment or buy a house in Grimsey. So rentals are, uh, would be the way to go. And living in a downtown environment like we have here would be self-sustaining for them because they could walk down the street and go to a restaurant and so on and so forth. And with NRT and with the GO train coming to town, uh, they would have ready access without cars to, to move around. I mean, so assuming that part of your round table talks, that's the type of thing you'd be talking about, is that right? Yeah, and, and to be fair, it's not just rentals. It's all sorts of different housing mixes, but rentals were part of that. But I'm sure they must they must have noted there was a shortage of rentals. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth by any means, but we certainly we don't have a shortage of rentals. We have none. Anyways, th thanks, Harry. I think you answered the question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Dunstall. Thank you, Mary Jordan, for allowing me to speak a second time. Um, and I'll direct my questions towards Walter. Uh, I'm, I'm a little stuck on the parking still, and I, I, I think it's unfair to take this development and compare it to uh, a, an apartment building on Slusser Boulevard. Again, it has above ground parking. When we're looking at probably market value uh, rental for this building, where I honestly believe, and we we all know, we've lived in this town long enough to know that the Slesser apartments would not be market value. They're probably a little below market value. And there might be people living in that apartment building that can't afford a car. And that's why there's empty parking spaces. But I would think that this is going to attract a, a more professional person or couples that might both have cars as we see a lot of in this town. And I think the parking deficiency is critical that we address it and we try and fix it. And if the building height and mass is too big for the amount of parking that we are providing for this development, 
and then we got to look at reducing them. And I, I'm, I'm stuck on the parking because it's downtown and being an owner of a building downtown that has rental apartments, lots of times tenants do not park in their assigned parking area when there's municipal parking around the area. It's convenient especially if you're living on the first or second floor and you've got groceries to take in and you don't want to go into the underground parking. So I'm, a, I'm a re really hesitant. The question I have for you, Walter, is what's a guarantee that a developer who promises us that it's going to be rental building uh, has to maintain it as a rental building and doesn't convert it to condominiums down the road? Uh, some other developer could buy it up and then come to us and say, we'd like to convert it to uh, condominium apartments can that be done or can we hold this developer uh, to ensure that it's always going to be a rental building is there any guarantee it's going to stay a rental building yeah, that's a good question uh councillor Dunstall, through you mr mayor um there are policies in our official plan our current official plan that talk about um uh, a rental conversion to condominium and uh uh, happens all the time to, and it's up to council if, if an application would need to be made to convert a rental uh, site to a condominium site so it's like a subdivision it's the same process okay so it can be done so, so, so we have policies that say if the um if the vacancy rates within the municipality are are very low like less than three percent is the number that's used in the official plan council has a reason to not approve a condominium application so it's all based on it's all based on you know what the situation and circumstances are uh in the municipality at the time a theoretical uh application is made for this uh uh, for this site, but again, the 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 applicants have committed to do rental apartments, and uh, that's what we're going with at this time. But there are policies to address that. Okay, uh, good, good answer. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I just think that uh, the height and massing is just a little too much, and I'm all about intensification downtown. We sure do need it, but it is only half a block away, or as Councillor Sharp said, 200 meters away from. Century condo, and uh, that's not very far. And I don't know why our official plan says four for on Main Street and half a block over or a block over. It's six stories, and we sure held that developer to four stories. He tried to get us up to five, and we never did. And now we're talking seven. So, uh, parking's a problem, and it is a problem downtown. And uh, that's what I've been hearing of recently. So, uh, I won't be voting in favor of this. Councillor Bain. Thank you. Um, I, I did. I did miss a few minutes of this uh, meeting, and I apologize for that. I had to attend to something. But um, this past summer, especially, I had um, I was out and about talking to the uh, the store uh, operators and owners on Main Street, um, mainly the part between um, Christie and Ontario. And uh, the one big complaint I got at that time. Well, there was two complaints, sorry. The one was about the fact that we were blocking off part of the street to allow the restaurants to uh, have an outdoor patio. And I tried to explain because of the pandemic and that's fine, people understood that. But there was a big concern about that. Like a lot of the non-restaurant places were saying, you're, you're taking away half our parking and it's hurting us financially. Uh, they don't support it. And, uh, but I wasn't gonna argue with them. And I just said to them, sorry, with the pandemic, we've got to do our bit, everybody's got to help. They understood that. Then the second question, or the second comment that came up was exactly what everybody's talking about right now, is that we're going to have a building, um, and I've always been a big supporter of this building. I like the idea of rentals and that, but I do have a lot of concerns all of a sudden. Uh, now, Councillor Dunstall mentioned about the, um, the possibility of switching to condominiums, and uh, somebody told me a little while back that each of these units, even though they're apartments, is going to be separately deeded, which concerns me. They say, and Walter, you can answer that in a second. Uh, and second of all, the other thing is that people are concerned about is that parking lot uh, between the liquor store and the old home hardware store, like the parking lot in the back there. There's just not enough spots. You can go there some days on the in the summertime, especially, and uh, there's just not enough spots, period, right now. And now we're talking about um, having 
less than ideal parking. And again, I don't care what the zoning was at Century Condos versus what it is here. We're still in the same area. We're still a couple hundred feet from each other. So we're gonna have to be consistent here. We've held the other developers feet to the fire. And, you know, like one of the developers said, fine, you know what, if this is the way it's gonna be, then I'll make all my units rental. But again, there's nothing to stop from going to condo after the made rental. So I get, I have to agree with my counter peers or my, some of my peers here that this is not gonna work this way. Uh, and I know some of the residents in the area are quite upset, even though I don't particularly represent that particular area, I do represent the people of Grimsby and I have to listen to them. I think the idea that uh, um, um, Harley's put forward is a fantastic idea. I just think not this particular development, that it's just not gonna work. We're gonna have to find something else. And there was even some concern about this, this public uh, space, which I think is a great idea as well. I think it's great that we got GBF. I'm all in support of a whole pile of things, but I can't get past the parking and I can't get past the fact that that public space is gonna take up a lot of uh, parking. If there's things going on, we're going to have people coming from elsewhere to park in there. Again, taking up parking spots that our businesses need. We've got to think beyond our restaurants. We have three or four restaurants that go in that section of the street. And yeah, we got to help them as much as we can. It's the same as we got to help the West End. There's a lot of businesses in this town. We can't just keep catering to a couple and spending all this money and, and all that. So I, I'm not going to support this tonight. Sorry, not in this uh, forum. Thank you. And Walter, if you could talk about the part where the units are supposedly deeded separately. I, I'm unfamiliar with that and wonder why. Thank you very much. Walter. Thank you, Councillor Vane. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I haven't heard that. I really don't know what it's about. I, I can't comment on it. Thank you. Like I say, it was just a rumor, but thank you. Councillor Vardy. Uh, yes, I'd just like to ask Walter, what are the uh, vacancy rates in Grimsby right now? Um, uh, I guess for, for rental. I haven't done a survey lately, so I, I couldn't tell you. Okay, thank you. Do you suspect they'd be low or high or average or I mean? Yeah, I, in, in terms of market, uh, market rentals, um, I would suspect that it's very low. Um, again, that's just anecdotal. Uh, that's just my experience uh, in just looking periodically uh, at what's out there and what's available. Um, but again, that's purely anecdotal. If, if there was an application for a condominium conversion, uh, we would require absolutely a, a, a fulsome study to be done uh, to, to make that determination. And, and that would be a council decision, wouldn't it? That's it would correct. have to come to council if they, they were going to convert. Okay, thank you. It's, yeah, condominium, uh, condominium approval is, uh, is, is, is council's. Uh, decision. Councillor Sharp. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Jordan. I'm uh, I'm on Kijiji right now, looking online, and I can see maybe 14 different advertised rentals in Grimsby. They're going from uh, the cheapest is 1450. It looks like it's a basement apartment. Uh, one bedrooms are in the range of 1950. There's a two bedroom townhouse um, for 2600, but there's a three bedroom for 2500. So um, there are, and I've looked before. Friends sometimes ask me if I know anybody who's renting, and I and I'll look on Kijiji or Facebook, and um, they'll have things posted on Marketplace, and that's that's typical. I think there's a rental availability in Grimsby. Um, what I wanted to talk about was uh, that courtyard. I wanted to share a little story. I was, I'm the representative for Grimsby on the lake or the West End. And I was down there talking to a resident um, about like watering. They don't have a hose bib to water the grass and we were requiring them to water their grass. And we were chatting on the waterfront trail talking about like where they could put it, who would pay for it. Does the Grimsby have water supply in that area? And um, 
the corner unit that's like uh, the townhouse kind of right across from Lang on the water. They came out onto their balcony and they were like, can you guys please keep it down? This was like before dark in the summer. And, um, and then later that resident emailed me and, um, and we talked and they, and they said that they regularly have people that just stop on the trail, have a little discussion. Me and this resident were talking about putting a hose bib in so they could use sprinklers to water their grass. And he's the, uh, the, the board, the condo board chair. And um, we regularly get, get calls about people talking about being having the waterfront trail too close to their balconies. And so you get this courtyard between the two heritage buildings and kind of walled up by the seven-story building on the other side. And on the second floor are residential apartments with, um, with balconies and windows. And so I imagine the ones on that side only have windows that face into the courtyard. And so in the summer, I mean, I'm, I've, I'm respectful, but I have a voice that carries. And if I'm sitting down there talking to another resident downtown about whatever their complaint may be or something, uh, I can tell you that the people who are sitting on the second, third, fourth floor, are they're going to hear me. And they're going to come out just like that resident at the corner by it lying on the water. And they're going to say, can you please keep it down or can you stop can you give me my privacy and um of course i will but not everybody will there's some people who will say hey um leave us alone and um i don't know if the establishment is going to serve alcohol if they're gonna if they have if they are going to serve until a certain time of the night i mean people when they have a couple of, of drinks in them really start to to carry their voice louder and so that picture that I saw with people served at tables it looked like coffee. It looked like daytime, but, um, you know, I could see some conflict between the use in the courtyard and, and those residents who live there. And I know we'll probably make the developer sign some kind of agreement, just like those residents on the waterfront trail. But it's like checking the terms on the Facebook agreement. Like they don't read them all and they wait. And then all of a sudden they're like, how come, you can't stop people from making noise to disturb me. So I had a few other things, but I guess my time is up. So um, I think there'll be a conflict with that courtyard use. And, and we should consider that. Thanks. Councillor Cadwell. Thanks, Mayor Jordan. And I'll be somewhat brief here. I, I do have a lot of concerns with the parking. I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm not sure when the uh, development uh, time frame when they'll get started, where they're planning to get started, what year. But I would think, uh, you know, if, if things go their way as soon as possible. And I'm just thinking about uh, when we do the uh, water main project on Main Street, we're going to be taking away a lot of parking spots right there for, for quite a period of time. So again, it, just uh, the, the, the shortage of parking to this, to this development, uh, doesn't sit well with me. Also, uh, the official plan, uh, the, the the DI zoning uh, recommends uh, 15 meters, which is four stories. I've always been a strong supporter and of our official plan and, and zoning. So uh, uh, with all due respect to staff's recommendation on this development, uh, for my reasons, I, I can't support the this proposal at this time. Thank you. Councilor Ritchie. Thank you, you Mr. Mayor. A uh, couple questions. First, actually, first I'll start with a statement. I want to thank staff for the report. Excellent unbiased report. Um, with that, I want to currently ask what the current parking bylaw is in the, in the, for the town. Just the ratios. Walter? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, Richie, through you, Mr. Mayor, the, the, the minimum requirement is uh, uh, 1.25 spaces per unit plus 0.25 for visitors. And then in the, in, in mixed-use uh, zoning categories or mis mixed-use sites, there, there is a shared parking calculation that will be applied uh, based on uh, uh, when peak demands are for different types of uses, like residential compared to office and so on. 
Great, thank you. Now this parking for this uh, for this rental um, is underground. Will that be open to the public? Um, I, I can't answer that question directly. Uh, maybe maybe uh, uh, Mr. Valentine might be able to answer that question in terms of how accessible the underground parking will be. But again, it is intended to be used by all of the uses on the property, including the residents, uh, the visitors of the residents, as well as uh, visitors of the commercial uses and uh, uh, employees of the commercial uses and community uses. Yeah, thank you, Walter. Uh, and through uh, your honorable mayor, uh, Councillor Ritchie, um, our P1 serves as our time of day shared lot. There's 27 spaces there. So that, those are open to any visitors of our building, whether they're visiting um, guests of the rental apartments or, or participating in the community uses at the hall or a potentially uh, gallery cafe that we will have on site. Um, you know, just as a point of reference, today we have 26 surface parking spaces um, and they're not adequately used by the, those existing space, those existing uses on site today. So we feel that's very adequate uh, and, and, and uh, justifying our use and program. Thank you. So next I wanted to, you know, as you, as I'm sure everyone knows with this council, we've had many developments come in front of us. that have actually met the 1.25 and 0.25 and many councillors still say that's not enough parking. So I'm kind of, you know, taken back a little bit that all of a sudden now not meeting the requirement is okay. Um, but I understand the reason is for rental apartments. So rental apartments, just looking at the report the staff provided, there was over 71 condo rentals available in Grimsby when the open house happened. Um, now I know they're condos, but you still would get into an agreement, a yearly lease or agree agreement to rent those. And simply by Googling Slessler Apartments, there's currently eight apartment rentals there currently available or will be available in the next month or two. So Hustle in this report uh, says here that they conducted a residential poll and that within 36 hours, 307 Grimsby residents had voted and 11 supported seven stories. 54 people didn't want development and 242 wanted a max of four stories. And I understand the official plan says four and then under circumstances, we can go up to six. Uh, I didn't say anything about going up to seven, but I'm sure with the will of council, we can do it all. Uh, but again, so one of the things that I look at is community benefit. And again, I don't know, um, I can't speak for the residents they represent, but I can speak that when I campaigned, they define responsible growth as four stories. And four stories is what I see here. And I haven't had the opportunity to talk to them uh, in regards if, if this development would, be, uh, would meet the community benefit towards them. But it's also something I ran my campaign on, which was four stories at that time. So without having that opportunity to speak to my residents, um, I do think seven stories is too high. And again, I'm very, well, you know, a little confused in regards that that this is again the first time that we're talking here for the de developments that we've seen that under the current bylaw of parking it is is being supported. Thank you. Stephanie, you have your hand up for a comment. Yes, thank you very much. I just want, would like to add a few things. Um, one, I would like to note the official plan does talk to, about considering reducing parking. Uh, so it does sort of outline that within your policies already. Um, it, there were concerns about, you know, taking up on street parking. Uh, there are mechanisms that you could, um, that I've seen applied elsewhere that you could use to actually um, restrict um, someone from the building to take a permit parking uh, up. That's maybe something that you could add um, that may be available as a mechanism to do so. And I, I know there it has been used uh, successfully um, for other sites that we've worked on too, where parking was a, a, a pretty big concern. And I know it is here as well too. 
Um, and then also too, I would just like to also add to is we did look at a few buildings. We did go out and count. Um, the reason why we do count at three o'clock in the morning is because that's that's what we find is the peak time when people are um, at home sleeping. And we did see a we did as sort of Harley mentioned is the one per unit that we sort of are recommending here and um, sort of have noted in our addendums that sort of staff have reviewed, that was on the upper end of uh, those four, four buildings. So I just wanted to sort of provide a little bit of that context there as well too, because I think it might help out with these discussions here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Councillor Bothwell. Thanks again, Mayor Jordan, for the second time. Um, I ran on responsible development as well. I also live in an intensification area and the downtown is another intensification area. I also support four stories only on Main Street and I've said that a number of times. I very much value the heritage character of Main Street and it's protected in our official plan specifically. The downtown intensification and transition areas were specifically put that way so that we could have vibrancy and intensification in the downtown to meet um, what our, our targets are. We have to meet them somewhere. Um, I will protect the Main Street East Corridor. I will protect the areas that, that where that development is not compatible. This is an area that we're, we're not going to win at the OLT because it's, it's meant for intensification specifically. It even allows for up to six. And that view study by the NEC was done and says there's no detrimental impacts at seven stories. Really hard to fight. I'm struggling with it with the parking. I really feel that um, we got to do something there um, and it is on us. I need Walter to clarify. Um, Walter, for the Main Street businesses, there is no requirement for them to provide any parking and they're totally, um, depend, not, doesn't matter what use they have, they could have a very high functioning use, but they all still have to draw from the public parking lot um, that we provide as a town. Is that correct? And that if there's, I understand there was two residential units approved above where the burned out building was in the Sunny Peach, whatever owned building. It was a two story with two rental units, um, residential units above the, the retail. And there was no parking required for those residential units. Can you clarify if that's correct? Thank you for your question, Councillor Bothwell. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, the, we, we have a uh, zoning provision, um, I wish I could call it up quickly, but I think it says something to the effect that <clears throat> um, uses can occupy buildings within the downtown without parking being a consideration. So, uh, so a, an office use can be replaced by a restaurant, can be replaced by a dance studio, can be replaced by whatever. Um, does it, regardless of how intense the use is, uh, the zoning permits the building to be occupied by a use as long as it's a permitted use without par a consideration for parking. Thank you. So, I mean, that's going to fluctuate depending on what types of businesses we get downtown. Um, this is for the developer, and Stephanie might be able to answer this one. Um, just want to clarify again, you did a review of the parking demand um, for the Balsam Lane parking lot on December 24th, and there was 162 spaces there in that Balsam lot. And you noted that even then, um, maybe just confirm that the peak demand on, on Christmas Eve was 81% uh, occupied and that there was still 30, 31 spaces available at that prime time. So from what you observed with the demand um, in the Balsam lot at that time, would you say that there was still room for some additional use? And that, as you mentioned, and this is maybe Walter, that, I mean, we can look at ways to manage that lot so that um, it isn't intrusive of residents using it uh, through some bylaw and other types of enforcement when we do our parking study. Um, so I think there's ways that we can mitigate any potential impact of, of, of use by residents by in, uh, invoking some type of bylaw or some type of, of rules. But Stephanie, can you clarify the parking demand please for Balsam? Thank you. Point of order, Mayor Jordan. It's in their report. So I just would- Mayor I'm, Jordan, point of order. Yes, Councillor Sharp. Are we on the staff report? The, the delegation is over and we're on the staff report. 
Well, if, if Walter, if you want to provide that, if you can't provide that, then I'll, I'll refer to the delegation. So go ahead, Walter. The delegation is over. We already that. gave the delegation an extra, we gave him five minutes and then 10 minutes and then it's over, it's done. A question this has been report. asked to Walter. Mayor Jordan, my, time is, my time is being spent on this too, Mayor Jordan. Please follow the orders of our procedure. That my point is, is clear. That Councillor Sharp, if you'd let me finish, that is why I am deferring it to Walter to answer the question. Yeah, thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, yeah, my recollection of the of the study that was done by uh, Ms. Hardis is uh, uh, is uh, what you said. It, there, there was there wasn't it wasn't a full lot during during uh, the the time the count was done. Thank you. And then I, I read that after five o'clock, less than 30% of parking spaces are occupied, resulting in less than half a lot being more than half a lot being empty during the evening. So I just wanted to, to note that, and I'm sure it'll come out when we do our parking study. When do you anticipate the parking study starting? Um, Walter, can you give me an idea on that? I, Mr. Mayor, I can probably take that one. Thanks, Brandon. Right. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, so we do plan on putting an RFP or request for proposal out uh, probably uh, early spring. And we expect that we're gonna do the count uh, in the summer months when we anticipate that, uh, that it would be busier in, in that area. So we're expecting maybe by fall that uh, we'd see some results from that. Thing. Thank you, Mayor. That's all my questions. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, Councillor Vane. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm just a little confused here. Like it's, I, and I'm talking more of the council position than anything else in that we've had other situations with other developers where we've been told flat out we can't win at OLT, and yet we'll, we'll go like crazy and fight it anyways. And yet now we've got something that doesn't conform to our official plan. I think we have a very good case of fighting it, and yet people are saying we can't win it. I, I'm just... This council has got to get on the same track. We can't keep fighting things like this, you know, when it suits us, this is not right. But anyways, that's just my opinion. I, I, I'm not going to support it. And I think we're sending the wrong message to the developer, which is unfortunate because it's not fair to him or them. Um, you know what? I, I mean, we're like with any other developer. Well, most of the time we're willing to work with them. So I, I think that the door is still open. I don't think anybody's shutting any doors, but I think in its current form, I, I don't think it's going to, it's going to fly. And, and I appreciate Harley and, and Marilyn and your time and stuff like that and talking to us. And I, like I say, it just it, having talked to a bunch of people in the area, it's, it's made a big difference. So thank you. Seeing no further questions or comments. Uh, I have the resolution here. And uh, since this is a really important talk, topic, I do want to make a couple comments of my own. Uh, yeah, I've wrestled with this decision and I've wrestled with uh, the fact that that there is a difference between Main Street and, and uh, this intensification area. And yes, it is council's right to uh, to with approval go up to six stories. And yes, uh, um, rental units are subject to, um, according to studies, less demand on parking. Unfortunately, our official plan doesn't doesn't defer or differ between uh, rental units and uh, and non rental units. So that that puts council in quite a dilemma with uh, 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 approving a unit that or a. Uh, uh, proposal that doesn't meet parking. And, and I really think that uh, the people from Castle Point Numa have really done a good job to, to explain that and, and to justify that, but it is, uh, our official plan doesn't speak on it and doesn't differ on it. And, and that causes a dilemma for, I, I, would, I would hazard a guess to think all of council. Um, the fact that that this is zoned differently um, to allow up to councils right up to six stories. Well, the proposal is for seven beyond council scope. Uh, 
And just given those things, given the, um, the fact, um, I really think that this is a great project and I, I think it, it will certainly be good for Grimsby and, um, and we'll see what happens. All right, uh, need a move in second. Thank, thank you, before we close, Mr. Mayor, can I make a comment? Yes, go ahead. I'm very proudly wearing a pin today. It's a Niagara pin. Uh, Wayne Furtick gave me this pin. Wayne Furtick and I have developed a very close relationship. As we all know, Wayne Furtick was the former owner of the Gables restaurant, the restaurant that I grew up in the backdrop of. Wayne Furtick has been a great supporter of this. Wayne Furtick is an elder statesman that we should all look to for guidance about collective decision making and building what's best for the future of Grimsby. I'm saddened to hear the disconnect today and the politicizing of a, a, a desperate housing need for our community. Mayor Jordan. Uh, Dave Sharp, you, you must not be feeling well uh, this evening because I keep hearing the same thing from you. Mayor so Jordan, just in closing, order. we're not gonna stop. Order, please, we're gonna Jordan. end the project. Guys, we'll see what the OLT. is not appropriate, Mayor Jordan. Yeah. Um, I, I think, not, I, Harley, unfortunately, you're going to... I'm sorry, Mr. Valentine, I, this is not an appropriate thing for a council meeting. Yeah, so so I, I understand your your um, comments, Harley, and uh, I understand Councillor Sharp's point of order, and and yes, it, it I, I agree with Councillor Sharp on this. So uh, now we need... Uh, and again, thank you, everyone, uh, for your presentation, and... and uh, uh, just thank you very much. Um, need a mover and seconder? Moved by Councillor Frake. Seconder, Councillor Vane. Recorded vote. I'll read the resolution. Moved by Councillor Frake, seconded by Councillor Vane. Resolved that report PA 22 06, proposed official plan amendment, file 26. Zero OP 16-2101 and zoning bylaw amendment file number 26T 16-2104 applications Castle Point Numa 19 Elm Street and 13 Mountain Street dated February 22nd 2022 be received that the official plan amendment attached to this report as Appendix A be submitted to Council for passage and the draft zoning bylaw amendment attached to this report as Appendix B be approved in principle. And I called for a recorded vote. Councillor Bothwell? Yes. Councillor Denstall? No. Councillor Frake? Yes. Councillor Cabell? No. Councillor Ritchie? No. Councillor Sharp? No. Councillor Vane? No. Councillor Vardy? No. Mayor Jordan? Unfortunately, no. That's defeated. All right, now we're moving to uh, correspondence. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. So there is a separate uh, resolution for the uh, AMO pre budget submission Pro Protect Together, Recover Together. I uh, need a mover and seconder for that. Councillor Bothwell. Seconder. Councillor Frank. Moved by Councillor Bothwell, second by Councillor Frick, whereas healthcare funding is a provincial and federal responsibility, and whereas from 2009 to 2020, a total of $415 million have been transferred from municipal operations to fund and build provincial hospitals, and whereas remaining long-term commitments to hospitals stand at $117.5 million as of 2020, which will also be financed from municipal operations, and whereas a hospital is one of the many public services that contributes to healthy communities and whereas municipal contributions to provincial hospitals takes away from the resources available for other municipal services that contribute to the health and well-being of residents. 
Oh, sorry, there's the other page. Whereas a community's total contribution to local hospitals also includes the donations made by benevolent individuals, groups, and businesses, along with municipal contributions. And whereas the communities require local shares to pay 10% of the capital construction costs and 100% of the cost of equipment, furniture, and fixtures, which includes medical equipment with big ticket prices, MRI machines, CT scanners, and x-ray machines. And whereas this translates to a 70% provincial share and 30% local share, individuals, groups, businesses, and municipalities of the overall cost of provincial hospital operations and cap capital projects, and whereas the adoption of the design build finance hospital mm -hmm. construction model, also known as alternative financing and procurement or P3 projects has increased local share amounts because they now include the cost of long-term financing. And whereas equipment replacement needs are increasingly frequent, increasingly expensive when the average equipment lifespan of just 10 years. And whereas the Association of Municipalities of Ontario has highlighted the local share of hospital capital con Contribute contributions is a major issue at its, in its 2022 pre-budget submission to the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of Corporation of the Town of Grimsby does hereby call for a provincial re-examination of the local share hospital capital calculation methodology to better reflect the limited fiscal capacity of municipalities and the contributions to health care services as they already provide to a community and further that a copy of this resolution be hereby circulated to the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Health, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing and Association of Municipalities of Ontario. Recorded vote. Councillor Bothwell? Yes. Councillor Genstall? Yes. Councillor Freak? Yes. Councillor Cadwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Yes. Councillor Vane? Yes. Councillor Vardy? Yes. Mayor Jordan? Yes. That's carried. Yes. All right, we need a mover and seconder for the remainder of the correspondence. Moved by Councillor Cadwell, second by Councillor Dunstall. Moved by Councillor Cadwell, second by Councillor Dunstall. Resolved that the following correspondent items be received. Report of the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force, AMO pre-budget submission, protect together, recover together, Town of Lincoln Resolution Partners for Climate Change Protection Program, City of Thorold Resolution Support for Increased Fines for Firearms Infractions, Niagara Region Triple Majority Achieved for Consolidated Transit System Bylaw 2021-96. All in favor? That's carried. All right, the next meeting of the Committee of the Whole is scheduled for March 7th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Um, just before we adjourn, uh, we will be back at uh, 9.10 for the uh, council meeting. Uh, good night, everyone, and we'll be back in uh, 10 minutes, or seven minutes. Thank you.
Good evening. I'd like to call uh, the council meeting of uh, Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022 to order. Uh, first, can everyone rise for the playing of the national anthem? Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command, with glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true Niagara Region and Grinsby are situated on treaty land. This land is steeped in the rich history of, first, of the First Nations, such as the Hattawendoronk, the Haudenosaunee, and the Shinanabe, including the Mississaugas of the, first, of the Credit First Nation. There are many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The regional municipality of Niagara and the town of Grinsby stands with all Indigenous peoples past and present in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands on which we live. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, uh, move to uh, mover and seconder for the adoption of the uh, agenda. Moved by Councillor Dunstall, second. This is the wrong one, this is... Oh, is that approval of the agenda? Oh, sorry. Councillor Dunsell, mover. And seconder, Councillor Bothwell. Moved by Councillor Dunsell, second by Councillor Bothwell. Resolved that the agenda for the February 22nd, 2022 council meeting be approved. All in favor? It's carried. All right, now we move to uh, adoption of previous minutes. We mover and seconder. Moved by Councillor Ritchie. Seconder, Councillor Cadwell. Moved by Councillor Ritchie, second by Councillor Cadwell. Resolved that the Committee of the Whole meeting minutes of February 7th, 2022, Council minutes of February 7th, 2022, and Committee of the Whole budget Minutes of February 17th, 2022 be approved. All in favor? Can I ask for a recorded vote, Mayor Jordan, please? Sure. Recorded vote has been requested by Councillor Ritchie. Councillor Boston? Yes. Councillor Dunstall? Yes. Councillor Frake? Yes. Councillor Cadwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Yes. Councillor Vane? Yes. Councillor Vardy? Councillor Vardy? You said yes, right? <laughs> Mayor Jordan? Yes. That's okay. Carrie. Next to the consent agenda. Yes. Any 
Need a mover and seconder for report TC 22-04. Moved by Councillor Ritchie. Seconder, Councillor Bain. Moved by Councillor Ritchie, second by Councillor Bain. Resolved that Council hereby approves the following items and the various consent items be approved on the recommendation as contained therein. Report TC 22-04, declaration of town-owned surplus lands 362 North Service Road. All in favor? That's carried. Need a mover and seconder for uh, first reading of the bylaw. Moved by Councillor Ritchie, second by Councillor Sharp. Oh, Councillor Bothwell, you have a question or comment? Um, can we just uh, vote separately um, with a recorded vote on bylaw um, uh, 2214, uh, 14G? All right, so that one would be lifted then. All right, so this, the first reading will be on bylaw 2208 to 2213. Is that right, Sarah? Sure. Okay, all right. Then we'll take the other one separately, Councillor Bothwell. Moved by Councillor Ritchie, second by Councillor Sharp. Resolved that leave be given to introduce bylaws 22-08 to 2213 inclusive and that same be read a first time. All in favor? That's carried. Okay. So I have a mover for um, the first reading of bylaw 2214 as Councillor Bothwell. Just need a seconder. Councillor Ritchie. Moved by Councillor Bothwell, second by Councillor Ritchie, resolved that they be given to introduce bylaw 2214 and that same be read a first time. All in favor? No, Mayor, I asked for a recorded vote because I oh, want to sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry Councillor Bothwell. And because I wanted to vote on it separately, please? Yes. yes. Yep. yep. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. Recorded, recorded vote requested, requested by, by Councillor Bothwell. Councillor Bothwell? No. Councillor Dunstall? Yes. Councillor Frake? No. Councillor Cadwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Yes. Councillor Vane? Yes. Councillor Vardy? No. Mayor Jordan? No. That's, That's carried. carried. All right, we just need a mover and seconder for second and third reading of uh, bylaws uh, 2208 to 2213. Moved by Councillor Cadwell, second by Councillor Ritchie. Moved by Councillor Cadwell, second by Councillor Ritchie. Result that leave be given to introduce bylaws 22-08 to 22-13. Inclusive read a first time, now be read a second and third time and finally pass. And that the mayor and town clerk do sign and seal the same and rule council to the contrary notwithstanding. All in favor? That's carried. All right. Need a mover and seconder for uh, second and third reading of 2214. Councillor Sharp moved. Seconder, Councillor Ritchie. Moved by Councillor Sharp, second by Councillor Ritchie. Resolved that leave be given to introduce bylaw 2214 
inclusive, read a first time, now be read a second and third time, and finally passed. And the mayor and town clerk do sign and seal the same and rule council to the contrary, notwithstanding. Recorded vote requested by Councillor Bothwell. Councillor Bothwell? No. Councillor Bothwell? Yes. Councillor Bothwell? Yes. Councillor Frank? No. Councillor Cadwell? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Councillor Sharp? Yes. Councillor Vane? Yes. Councillor Vardy? No. Mayor Jordan? No. That's carried. All right, now we move to uh, number 15, announcement portions. Councillor Ritchie. Thank you through the mayor. I just wanted to first of all, thank all staff for their hard work over the budget. Um, I've never been a part or experienced a budget that was so easy to read, um, easy to understand and easy to follow. And I believe that showed on uh, February 17th in our budget meeting uh, and passing of this budget truly shows, in my opinion, that our town's heading in the right direction as it received unanimous support from all of our councils, especially in election year, where that budget should have been one of the hardest budgets to pass. I also wanted to give uh, recognition to our director of planning. Although our time is with, with the director has been cut short, I want to thank her for all her dedication and hard work. Your knowledge and expertise truly made Grimsby a better place. And I cannot uh, fault another municipality searching and seeking someone of your caliber. I want to wish you all the best in the future and your future endeavors. And thank you for your time and dedication to Grimsby. All right. Any other announcements? Again, I just want to uh, reiterate uh, Councillor Ritchie's uh, accolades to staff on, on the on the budget. Uh, certainly. Um, I, I can actually say that uh, as my nine years as an alderman and um, and four years as mayor, that was um, certainly the uh, less uh, or smoothest budget meeting that um, that uh, we we have ever I, or I have ever personally experienced. And and I think it was uh, due diligence and preparation uh, ahead of time by staff. And um, and I know that staff uh, really. Uh, pushed very hard to um, get a budget that 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 came in correctly the first time. So it made our jobs as councillors uh, much easier. Councillor Cadwell. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Jordan. And I, uh, I too, want to personally thank Antonetta for uh, all the great things she's done in Grim for Grimsby. Uh, really, it's been uh, it's been a real pleasure to uh, to work with her, uh, helping move Grimsby forward. And uh, thank you, Antonetta. Sorry to see you leave, but I wish you the very best in your future endeavors. Uh, yeah, thank you. Just the, another thing I'd like to speak to is uh, the Grimsby Chamber of Commerce are, have put an email out, email out sorry, uh, looking for uh, nominations for uh, to sit on their, their board. And the uh, deadline closes uh, March 1st at uh, four o'clock. So anybody interested, businesses, uh, supporters of, uh, of, the, of the chamber, uh, you want to try to, you want to sit on a board? Uh, again, chamber's looking for board members. Uh, March 1st, four o'clock deadline. Thank you. Councilor Ritchie. Thank you. To the chair, I'd like to address an article from January 27th, and more specifically comments made or not made. I would like to start by saying harassment of any kind, especially sexual harassment is unacceptable. I still have not heard from our mayor. And once again, his action inaction may be perceived as condoning these actions. Councillor Vardy, when you make comments such as the mother and me reacted, I think you need to stop making excuses because I feel when an individual makes an excuse, they're only lying to themselves. We should be responsible for our actions as leader in the community and speak out against behaviors such as these. Harassment, and more specifically sexual harassment, 
should never ever be sensationalized. And I'm offended by these comments. And to try to put blame on another person is totally unacceptable. I can only imagine if the shoe was on the other foot, what would happen? I was offended by her comments from January 19th. And this is not the first time that I've seen Councillor Vardy behave this way. It was in this term of counsel when I witnessed her gently place her hand on another male counselor's lap and proceed to rub his lap while winking at him. This counselor asked for her to remove her hand very firmly and had to repeat himself until she complied. Once again, as leaders of the community, this behavior is unacceptable and in no which way, shape or form should this ever be sensationalized. If I didn't speak up, one may think this kind of behavior is acceptable and repeat their actions as I've seen with Councillor Vardy. Thank you. Councillor Bothwell. Thank you, Mayor Jordan. Um, I asked a question of the clerk this week because I've received a number of resident concerns regarding um, some councillor's social media posts and um, that it's on a councillor webpage and they're concerned that it's reflective of the position of council. And I think it's really important for social media too that we're clear on um, what our roles are there and what we're portraying to the community. Could I ask the clerk if she could please share with councillors the social media policy. Um, and if, if it's not strong enough, we might have to have a look at that. Uh, I would just appreciate if, if that could be done um, when she has time. Thank you. That's been noted by the clerk. Thank you, Councillor Bothwell. Councillor Vardy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have to address the comments of Councillor Ritchie. That is an out and out lie and you know it. I don't know what you're trying to prove. My original remark to you was about your adolescent behavior, which I find extremely offensive. But the, what you're, the thing that you've just raised now is an out and out lie. Are you and sure? You know it. Yes, I'm very you're lying. Sure. Yes, I'm very sure. You are a liar. Uh, both of you I'll are getting a, a warning complaint. right now. So. I'll be filing a complaint. Very that good. I hope you do. I hope you do. I will, I you because you, you have no right to make those kinds of comments. What you'll, do, what you'll do to get right. any kind both of political advantage is you really out of line. And I know there's other witnesses here, too, that saw it. Probably unmuted himself, so. Councillor Vane. I am, I'm disappointed that we're lowering ourselves to this level, but it's, I got to respond to different, two different things here. The social media thing, I think that's something that uh, really is, um, is something that we need to address ourselves. Um, I, I think to call it out, I mean, I, I saw another counselor from another town that is, is like some others I know attacking another counselor because of their involvement on things. You know what, we're all adults, let us do our thing. And if we think it's inappropriate, we'll deal with it. But uh, to call it, make a policy on how we run our lives, I don't agree with that. Uh, as far as the, the comment between Councillor Vardy and Councillor Ritchie, I'm disappointed that we've even come to this, but um, there is a, um, well, I forget what we call them now, we don't do them anymore. The, uh, the reports from those people, um, Charles Harnick group, anyways, whatever the report's called, uh, it was clearly stated in there that Councillor Vardy had inappropriately touched Councillor Sharp in Ottawa or in Toronto. I forget where the AMO meeting was. I wasn't there. Um, that point of order, that is another lie. That it's is in writing. another lie. It's in writing. You never yes, denied you, it. All right, can we just can lie. we just move on? So we've got to stop this down, Mr. You both mute them both because we're no, just moving no. on from now. Councillor Vane, you're finished. And Councillor Sharp, I'm not even acknowledging your uh, Thing. Uh, Antonetta, I, I just want to thank here. you. Point of order. I want to thank you very much for, for your of service order. here, and I wish you all the best. Point uh, of order. In Calgary. Point of order. Point of order. All right. Can point of order. Councilor Sharp has his hand up. You should be recognizing him. Councilor Sharp, I have Sharp, a point of order. Ahead. I'm in the middle of speaking. I don't believe it's fair for you to cut me off because you don't like what I'm saying. That's not appropriate. That's not I a don't think It's appropriate for you to tell lies. I'll show it to you in writing. Can I just so yeah, good. You do it? that. File a complaint. Yeah, what do we need to do? There's no point in lying, Councillor Vardy. I'll let Councillor Sharp 
go. Councillor Sharp, Councillor Sharp, go ahead. Like everybody yeah. else, I have an opinion too. I'm allowed to speak because you don't agree with what I'm saying. Doesn't make it a reason for you to overrule me. I'm merely making a comment. I'm not looking for an argument. Councillor Vardy's the one who jumped in. Discipline her, not me. I'm I disciplining both of you, Councillor Vane, and I, I'm not going to argue. Uh, I'm not I've moved on. I've I moved on really to Councillor Sharp. Out. I'm pointing so. out facts. If you want, we can bring up the facts. We can bring up the report. It's clearly stated there. I mean, if you want to deny it, go ahead. But I'll bring it up. Is, is this your announcement, Council. Councillor Vane? I'm sorry? Is this your announcement? Yes, I think, I think unfortunately, Mr. Mayor, right. I think you're, I think ahead, you're then. unfair. I think you're you're not playing you're not being the proper appropriate position as a mayor is to allow people to speak not to make personal decisions on what we're saying. If Councillor Vardy disagrees with me, I respect that. That's her choice, but I can prove it. In fact, as can Councillor Ritchie and anybody else who's still got a copy of that report. So all I'm trying to say is, as I started saying, is it's disappointing that we've dropped ourselves to this level. I'm sorry you find it offensive. It doesn't work to your uh, whatever way. But that's not appropriate, Mr. Mayor. You've got to allow people to speak. Just because you don't agree with them doesn't mean you should be cutting this off. Councillor Sharp is constantly jumping on you for this. I'm just trying to be respectful here. I'm just trying to point out to Councillor Vardy that I don't get what she has done to Councillor Richie. Mr. Mayor, them, you have to stop this. And it's between them to work out. I'm going to let him speak. Uh, he, he's welcome to continue on as long as he wants. No. I just want to finish my statement is all I was trying to say is it's in writing and I don't think there's any point in us arguing over it is all I'm trying to say. We have written proof. Thank you very much for listening. Councillor Sharp. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Jordan. Um, it was August 2019 in Ottawa at the Byword Market in that Irish pub when Councillor Vardy put her hand on my leg um, Harry Schlang was present. So Mayor was, Jordan, I think this is a very inappropriate. I told her twice to stop. Under and she did stop. I'm sorry. This is very inappropriate under announcements. So is he jumping in? Let's move on. I would be this happy. This is not called announcements. Well. There was several counselors there. This is there. not called announcements. This is called right. facts. They're using it's them. Not announcements, right. Councillor Vane. Facts. Hmm. facts. All right. Uh, next meeting. Uh, next council meeting will be held on March 7th, 2022, immediately following the Committee of the Whole. You know, mover and seconder to um, leave to, or for the first reading of the uh, confirming bylaw. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Ritchie, Councillor Dunstall. Moved by Councillor Ritchie, second by Councillor Dunstall. Resolved that leave be given to introduce bylaw 22 15, and that same be read a first time. All in favor? That's carried. Need a mover and seconder for second and third reading. Moved by Councillor Cadwell, second by Councillor Bothwell. Moved by Councillor Cadwell, second by Councillor Bothwell. Resolved that leave be given to introduce bylaw 22 15, read a first time, now be read a second and third time, and finally pass. And the mayor and town clerk do sign and seal the same and rule council to the contrary, notwithstanding. All in favor? That's carried. Meeting is adjourned. Good night.